Welcome to Norse Cove, the number one podcast for you Minnesota Vikings. I am your host and producer. My name is James Pagoshnik. Thank you guys so much for listening. And at the other end of the tin can and string, we have our analyst and co-host. You know him from numerous blogs and podcasts around the internet, most notably from theathletic.com. He is Mr. Useful Human, Arif Hassan. Arif, you watched all of that 49ers-Packers game. I think you have a problem. I, I do. It's my job. <laughs> well, at least it's a, <laughs> unlike most problems, it at least provides a, a, a way for you to like make a living for your family and all. So, I mean, yeah, of, of problems to have. Yeah. It's like a reverse drinking problem. It just puts money in my pocket and I'm sober. <laughs> just sadly, sadly sober. <laughs> I didn't. Uh, I didn't end up watching a lot of it. I ended up watching enough of it where I, had, after the, uh, after I forget if it was the field goal or or just a really dumb touchdown. I remember messaging you early in the third quarter and be like, "All right, well, I'm going to eat, and <laughs> then we can talk about recording." Because no- normally <laughs> we go to the end of the game, or if it's a blowout, we figure out you know when we're going to start. But I was like, "No, no, I'm gonna I'm gonna go eat. <laughs> I'm not concerned about what's going to happen in this game." clearly san francisco is not ready for the situation and uh and we'll we'll, we'll talk after we'll, we'll figure something out maybe something else will be on tv on like every channel yeah <laughs> it'll be, i'm sure something will be able to distract us for a little bit anyway well welcome to this episode of norse code hope you guys are uh, having a fantastic if not hectic week uh we will be talking about the lions game which is scheduled to happen this sunday so hope you guys are ready for that we have an interview with uh, with another member of pride of detroit and we have a fantastic mailbag to go through as well but before we start just want to thank you guys so much for listening we have uh, lots of cool stuff that uh, that we've been doing and we want to thank you guys so much for supporting us uh, especially those that are hooked on the the patreon area i uh, want to thank two more people who've signed up for patreon I want to thank uh, uh, zachary carlson and eric uh, both thank you guys so much for for joining us on patreon where we are posting the bonus episodes including the one that's coming out uh right as you're seeing this episode uh so you should have access to that uh bonus episodes are going out uh, at least once a week over on patreon so if you like this uh, if you like the show would like some maybe it's not necessarily football related stuff you can find it over on patreon you go to patreon.com slash norse code and for three dollars and fifty cents a month you too can have access to the bonus material or you can go to paypal.me slash norse code as well as we announced last episode we have merchandise yay merchandise and some of you took up the challenge <laughs> Of picking up the baby onesies that we were joking about <laughs> last episode, I, I got a couple of screenshots and 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 things sent my way of people who went out of their way to buy baby clothes with the Norse Code uh, logo on it. Again, thank you to Draw Play Dave for that for the for the new logo and everything. Uh, it appears to have uh, propagated everywhere it needs to, as far as iTunes feeds and all that. So, but if you are interested in having a fantastically just just a sharp well-made product uh you can go to threadless.com or rather you can go to norsecode.threadless.com and head over to the collection uh area you know we were we were joking about the whole baby clothes thing and people have been purchasing the onesie and like some infant shirts and everything which just makes makes me laugh i guess the benefit of that is that when you're in public and you're wearing like norse code stuff i have to imagine that's a little odd don't let me stop you by the way no uh do do that as much as you want but like maybe you, you feel like you don't want to talk to a stranger and they want you to explain why there's like a dinosaur draped over some dude that's like ticked off with the other guy yelling on your shirt um, <laughs> and why is the turkey leg crossed out <laughs> yeah um uh, but the benefit is that no one cares what babies are wearing. So <laughs> you could, and most of the time they don't even see it. The ones that you just be worn in the house. So I, I could see the logic behind it. Um, I will say that in terms of, uh, first of all, just get the merchandise you want. But I will say, um, in terms of supporting the show, I just found out today while checking my email that uh, the returns for us on 
the phone cases is like enormous relative to like a t-shirt or something. Uh, and also a hoodie, but not like proportionally as much as a phone case for some reason. I have no idea why this is. Maybe phone cases are like the market for phone cases just generally has larger profit margins. I don't know. But that also seems like just like a good, like I would I would have gotten one if they had one for a Google Pixel. Like that just seems like a, a, like a great use of that particular type of merchandise. So uh, yeah, if you wanted to support the show a little bit more and get something out of it, I would recommend a phone case or uh, a hoodie. Yeah, <laughs> helps us a little bit more than their shirt, but get the shirt if you want a shirt. I mean, just get what you want, but yeah, it's, it's, that's what you're deciding between. Yeah, as we had uh, as we'd mentioned last uh, last episode, this isn't really a money making venture for us because it's it's not something it really that, can't be. No. no, it's it's not something that 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 we're that we're set up as as you know we're we're not in the t shirt selling business. But uh, if you do want to do it, you know we make a we make a couple of bucks each uh, each purchase. So if you are interested in such a thing, you can go to threadless dot com slash norse code and we have our new logo on a whole mess of different items that uh, that people have been interested in and purchasing so uh again norsecode.threadless.com uh i think my order is coming tomorrow or your order is coming tomorrow rather uh oh wow that's pretty fast well a- according to this it was coming out of st cloud for you so i don't oh. know why it was coming out of like kentucky for me but i'm just not going to question it that's great. Did I get a mask? You did not. You really should have. You know ugh, the the, the fact that uh, the the fact that they they made a Norse code mask did make me laugh hysterically. <laughs> and then when somebody uh, was the like then when it was one of the first two things purchased, I I was so I I, I laughed incredible. even harder. So it was speaking right. of, I was uh, I was I was buying cat food for my cat. As one don't does. know why I need to explain that. Uh, and. Uh, I was, I was at the Chuck and Don's on, um, in Northeast and, uh, I, I was just like talking, like I was talking to the cashier. I was like, yeah, this is our address or whatever. Um, because we're, um, like we, we get the discount there and, um, some guy like walks up to me and he's like, are you a reef? And I was like, uh, yeah, of Norse code. And I was like, oh, that's one of the places, yeah. And he's like, yeah, I recognized your voice, which I think is hilarious because, like, you haven't had that these... happen yet, or you? Well, no, because it's usually people just like see me and they recognize the avatar, right? Oh. But I'm wearing a mask now, and so he's just like, I recognized your voice. That hasn't happened where someone has recognized me from the voice but not the face. I think that's phenomenal. Yeah. Um, also, whoever I met, you never told me your name. Uh, or if you did, I've forgotten. I'm sorry. Um, but hey, thanks for listening, dude. Your dog is adorable. <laughs> right on. Yeah, I was at uh, I was at a bar in downtown Grand Forks. I believe it was Joe Black's. And I was, in, no, in fact, I know it was Joe Black's because I was upstairs throwing darts. And that's the only place you can throw darts upstairs in, in Grand Forks. So I was, uh, I was throwing darts and I happened to run into a buddy of mine who I know, who who I know had listened to the show or, or still does. And he had a friend with him. And all I heard, like I was, I was talking to, talking to my buddy and all I heard from like 25, 50 feet away was, I know that voice. <laughs> <laughs> it's the voice. And he came a little closer and, and, and I said, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. And he went, you're the other guy on Norse code, right? You, you're, the it's, other it's, guy. it's a reef in you. <laughs> I was like, you did not say the other guy. It was something like the other guy on Norse code. And I went, yeah, it's I'm, incredible. I'm, I'm, I'm James Koshnik. I'm, I'm the other guy on Norse code. And like, <laughs> I've, I've, I've actually had some version of that happen a couple of times now where, you know, my last name is, is difficult enough for anyone to pronounce. People in my family still have issues with it, but like, <laughs> it's it, i don't expect listeners to 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 full on get it or something but i it's like you're james from north i was like yeah that's that's that is actually me so no the the voice thing is a is is a real thing that's that's, that's funny it also, i guess i have before. a fairly distinctive voice i guess i knew that but it is funny that that translated <laughs> me like wait a second i'm not listening in my car what's what's going on here <laughs> wait what's going on i don't uh, i don't understand this at all all right, well, welcome to this episode of Norse Code. Again, I want to thank you guys so much for listening. And the first thing that we're going to do is we are going to go to a Lions preview that Arif taped earlier today with a, Jer- with a Jeremy Reisman over at Pride of Detroit. So we're going to go to that interview right now. 
All right, I'm here with Jeremy Reisman of Pride of Detroit, uh, both heading up their podcast, which I was just on. Uh, they do it on, on Twitch as well, which is interesting, um, as well as uh, the chief writer there. How you doing, man? I'm doing great, Arif. Good to hear your voice again. <laughs> after after so long, <laughs> uh, all those days stretch into weeks uh, around these parts. So <laughs> very true. <laughs> uh, yeah, let's talk about the the Vikings Lions game. Uh, we'll go uh, position by position like we usually do, um, but uh, I, I guess more more interesting than anything else is is Matthew Stafford, right? Like obviously. Sure. So what's the deal there? <laughs> There's a lot going on. Uh, if you're just talking about the COVID stuff, uh, he's currently on the reserve COVID list. Basically, it sounds like, according to Adam Schefter and uh, Kelly Stafford, he right. came into close contact with someone who had the virus. So he, he didn't necessarily test positive. According to Kelly, he didn't test positive or he, he tested negative, I should say, on Wednesday, tested negative again on Thursday morning. So it looks like if it continues in that direction and, and who knows with incubation periods and all that sort of stuff. But if he continues to test negative, he should be good to go on Sunday, but that means he has a, a week where he's not practicing. He's not going through walkthroughs, but he is allowed to be in those virtual meetings. So uh, that's, that's the long and short of it for now, but uh, obviously things can change in, in a jiffy. Cool. Um, yeah. So very similar to the Cameron Dantra situation for Vikings fans uh, went on the COVID reserve list on a Wednesday uh, as a result of close contact. Uh, had multiple tests come back negative uh, and was activated on Saturday for Sunday's game. Obviously did not practice with the team. Um, w- would have been nice to have more than a half of a game with him when he did come back. Although I imagine that has very little to do with, uh, with the COVID reserve list. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, and th- so that, that I think opens up a discussion about some of the other quarterbacks on the roster, but first let's talk about Stafford because I think it is likely that he'll end up playing. Um, so, how would you assess his level of play so far? Certainly not anything like last year, but, um, you know, not bad, right? Yeah, no, he's not playing bad football. I think I think Lions fans might think differently. Um, <clears throat> oh, okay. Because they, because they always do. Uh, right. Let's be honest. If the wins aren't coming, then it's a quarterback's fault. Um, but he certainly hasn't been as good as he was last year. And I think that some natural regression, given how good he was last year, was, was kind mm. of in the mix anyways. It was probably going to happen. Obviously made a, a couple critical mistakes against the Colts last week, especially the pick six when they were trying to get back into that game. But overall, he hasn't exactly been put in uh, in great situations. They're they're facing the second longest uh, third down yardage every time he's on yeah, the field. What was, that, what was that stat? That's in that stat. Yeah, well, last week against the Colts, it was literally over 10 yards. It was third, it was third and 10.01 or something or <laughs> 10.1. That's that's how bad they've been on first and second down. And part of it is their insistence on, you know, being the, the 2010 through 2018 Seattle Seahawks, uh, where they're just running on first and second down all the time, almost independent of what the score is or the situation is or where they are on the field. And so they're getting it. And, and unlike the Seahawks, they're just not very good at running the ball either. So um, that they're finding themselves <laughs> in a, a lot of third and longs, a lot of second and longs. And, you know, it, it Give Crawford Stafford some credit there for for getting himself out of a lot of those. You know his yards per attempt is still pretty high. Um, it, it, he certainly seems to be testing the ball down the field a little bit more out of the bye week than he did earlier in the season. But <clears throat> overall, I, it's kind of the same old story with Stafford. He's just he's not really being put in positions to win, and he's still winning more often than he should be. But overall, it just doesn't look as good. Uh, I'm going to look up the third down stat overall while we keep talking, but. Um, that, uh, we, we should talk a little bit about, um, your level of confidence in, um, the best quarterback to ever come out of Purdue football ever in history. Don't look that up. <laughs> David Blau, uh, as, uh, as well as Chase Daniel, who's probably more likely to play in this scenario. Yeah. Uh, I mean, David Blau played okay last year. I think, I think there were a lot of issues that you see with an undrafted rookie <laughs> just being thrown in midweek because that was all thrown together. You know, he came <laughs> ben in. Ben DiNucci. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it was, it was kind of a situation like that where Stafford went down the, you know, three weeks prior to that. Um, <laughs> they, they bring in, I, I'm, I'm struggling to even remember his name. That's how crazy it was. It wasn't David Blau. Jeff Driscoll. It was Jeff Driscoll. Thank you. Yeah. And then right before the Thanksgiving day, game uh, i think on monday we find out jeff driscoll 
is now injured. And so he has two days to prepare for the Chicago Bears defense. And, and <laughs> the sec- his second throw of the game, he throws like a 60-yard touchdown. So we're like, okay, maybe, you know what? Maybe this works out. But then after that, you know, it kind of fell back to re- reality. I think he went 0-5 to finish the season, and and rightfully so. Uh, issues with kind of navigating the pocket. Um, I think that that's just kind of adjusting, I think, to the NFL speed and reads and things like that. So, you know, we didn't get to see much of him this year yet, obviously, with no preseason. Um, maybe there's a little bit of jump up there, but I, I wouldn't expect to see him as as the backup, as the potential starter on Sunday. I think, they, I, I think you know, they, they gave Chase Daniel the, the Chase Daniel deal where right. like, how, how is he getting Living that much dream. money to be a backup? Uh, <laughs> but he he's almost certainly the backup. I, I don't think that's like you know, clipboard money. I don't, I don't think that's, you know, right. they just needed a veteran in the right. room. He's, he's no Sean Mannion. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Right. Well, so uh, based off of what you've seen of Chase Daniel, including his death by a thousand paper cuts game against the Vikings, um, what what is your level of confidence if he is forced to play? I mean, I, I'm not going to pretend like I've sit here and, and, and done a, a, a deep dive on his tape or anything like that. Basically, I can just go off of what I saw in training camp, and it wasn't encouraging, I would say, to say the least. Um, accuracy issues, um, decision-making issues, which you'd hope you wouldn't see out of a veteran like that, but obviously seeing something on tape and, and doing it on the field, is there, there's quite a big bit, bit of difference between those two things. So, um, you know, it – it's it's obviously a huge step down for Matthew Stafford. I think that's just the simplest way I could put it. <laughs> right. I mean, that's the that's why there would be a Chase Daniel deal. All right. So uh, I'm going to find out what proportion of plays are, are uh, third and long real quick. But mm-hmm. at the moment, actually, the Lions rank fourth in, um, in, in average yards to go on third down. Uh, I'll give you three guesses as to who ranks first. <laughs> uh, Jets? Uh, nope. Uh, man, I don't know. This, this is, I didn't realize I was on a game show. No, yeah, it's, this is how it works now. Uh, no, actually, uh, you're playing them this week. So, oh, it's, it's I probably should have guessed. Really? <laughs> yeah. You guys got a good running game. What, what's the deal with that? Just taking a lot of sacks? Uh, yeah, sure. Why not? <laughs> <All right. laughs> Um, but yeah, so the Lions rank uh, looks like third overall in the number of plays that are between seven yards to go and 12 yards to go, um, which uh, given that they've only played seven games versus a lot of people playing eight games is interesting. It's probably a high proportion. Sure. Uh, I'm doing like quick math on the fly. This is exactly what listeners tune in for. <laughs> um, all right. So the Lions, oh my God, the Vikings are just awful at this. Hold on. <laughs> Uh, so in percentage of third down plays that are, uh, that are between seven and 12 yards to go, the lions continue to rank fourth. The Vikings rank first by a country mile. Oh my gosh. Wow. (laughs) Okay. Uh, yeah, it's probably actually, they they are throwing the ball a little bit more on first and second down. Uh, but also cousins is like bad this year. So (laughs) it's like, it's gotta be part of it. Um, okay, cool. So uh, that brings us, I think, to a discussion uh, involving the running backs. The Lions have uh, like 19 or 20 running backs. I don't have the exact number, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> they've got uh, a, a they've Chicago got, Bears tight end level. Let's just say that. Right. Yeah, it's 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 impressive. <laughs> um, they've got a kick returning running back. They've got a blocking running back. They've got a pass catching running back. They've got um, a, I guess you could call him a power back. Um, They've got a former second round pick that is from two years ago running back and Jonathan Williams. Yes. yes. <laughs> he, so, he gets in his own category of just yeah. being there. <laughs> uh, and they've got Kareth White. Um, who, they did. Yeah. Super well, he, athlete. Great, uh, great college numbers, uh, former bear uh, and currently injured. Yep. Uh, that's that's too bad. I love those guys. I'm like I'm like way too interested in running backs that were like undrafted but crazy athletes. And and um, I, I know for a fact they were excited about that guy. I think he may have gotten a chance to maybe get up to the big leagues. You know, he's on the practice squad IR. Um, but but I, I know for a fact they liked him. And uh, you know, once they they lost some of the guys that they had at the beginning of the season, they they lost Ty Johnson to the waivers, and then their uh, <clears throat> their fifth round pick Jason Huntley 
uh, got claimed through waivers when they originally cut him. I think he's on the Eagles now. So they were looking kind of for that speedy pass catching back and, and they were excited about him. But uh, yeah, the injury obviously put those plans in the trash. Uh, I mean, they always had a super, they could have just kept Zach Zenner, dude. Come on. <laughs> Uh, no, let's let's talk a little bit about running backs who are going to actually play. So Adrian Peterson's getting the bulk of the carries. It seems like DeAndre Swift is getting um, – is this a is this a drive-by-drive drive running back rotation or is it like a situational put him in in third and long sort of it's, thing? It's, it's really right now it's more of a drive-by-drive drive thing. Um, yeah. Adrian Peterson's usually the first one in the game. He was the first one in both the halves last week. Um, in terms of like snap count, though, it, it does seem like Swift is, is has overtaken him overall. It's mm-hmm. just, I think early on, they, they want to kind of establish that physical running game. And it's always Adrian Peterson to, to be that guy first, much to basically everyone's chagrin. Because as as I'm sure maybe you've seen, his yards per carry has literally dropped every single week this, this season. Uh, now to a point where he's <laughs> under two yards a carry, uh, which is almost impressive in, in how phenomenal it is uh but but yeah i think it's it's more of a drive-by drive thing they're just they, they want to keep everyone fresh um the the only time it's situational is when they do bring um almost an amir abdullah uh carry on johnson in the game uh he's definitely their third down guy okay um so uh what would you how would you assess the performance of, of peterson and swift i think i think both get I, I think peterson gets a little bit more of a bad rap than he deserves i think the problem there is just they they look a little pre- too predictive when he's out there. Um, they, they typically bring in a fullback or, or they might bring a, a wide receiver into the line. And it's just like they are telegraphing a run there. And Adrian Peterson doesn't have a shot. He's getting hit two yards uh, behind the line of scrimmage. So that, that yeah, I mean, he's used to that. <laughs> I'm sure he is. <laughs> um, early on, it, it, it looked you know, it looked great. I think when he has a hole, he's still kind of that physical runner. We've, we've actually seen him even shake some guys at 35, which is still very crazy for me to see, especially mm. in a Lions uniform. Uh, and and so... It, don't have a lot of old, good running backs, famously so. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, I, I, I just feel like he hasn't really been given a shot to, to gain yards lately. I don't think it's an issue where he's batted down physically where he's maybe lost a step. I mean, he's not going to break out long runs anymore. Mm-hmm. It's just, it's not that he doesn't have that speed, but in terms of, you know, running between the tackles, if, if there's a gap, like he, he's still got the vision. I mean, he's, he's got the veteran of a, he's got the, you know, the veteran vision of a, of someone who's been in the league for 15 years. So um, I think that's probably his best feature and, and he's still a pretty physical back. He definitely doesn't get knocked backwards very much um, as, as always for, for his career. So I think, sure. I think it's just a matter of like they're tipping their plays when he's out there. So maybe mix it up a little bit when he's out there. Right. It's kind of, so the, the, the other side of that though, is that if you're throwing the ball with Adrian Peterson on the field, you've just like, you're at a disadvantage. Yeah. Yeah. And, and they, they've tried it a little bit and he's actually caught, I think more balls than he he typically does in a season. I I know he's usually like what around 10 or 12 a a season at most. And I think he's probably already halfway there. He kind of like 30 with Favre and then like never again. Yeah, uh, <laughs> and he's up, right, to, he's up to seven. He's got seven so far, seven for, go. for 55. <laughs> <laughs> and what about DeAndre Swift? Swift, it feels like he's on the verge of, of breaking through something. He does. He has, I think, one big play uh, this entire season. It was, a, I want to say, in the 50s. Yeah, 54-yard run. Um, he had that 100-yard game uh, a couple weeks back, um, but just hasn't really been given same thing. Hasn't really been given the opportunities. I think the, the most disappointing part is not even that it's not that he's not getting the rushing opportunities it's that he's not really being the impact player that I think a lot of people thought he would be in the receiving game only has 23 catches this year for 174 yards, um, averaging 7.6 yards per, per catch. And you're not, you're obviously not going to average, you know, the 18s that wide receivers are out of the backfield, but, um, I, I would have expected them to be a little more creative with that. He started out the season kind of more in that receiving back role before he's, you know, in, in more recent weeks been kind of 50, 50 splitting with, with Peterson in, in rushes from the backfield, but, um, hasn't seen that passing role increase. And I, I would have expected them to use that agility to use that kind of short space speed to, uh, to beat up on, on opposing linebackers more than they have. And so, um, that that's probably the biggest disappointment yet. I, I still think he's going to be a good running back. Um, they just need a, a good offensive line right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, well, we'll get to the offensive line in a second. Let's um, let's talk a little bit about receivers. So we don't have 
North Dakota's favorite son, Kenny Galladay. <laughs> um, he is from Chicago and went to the University of Northern Illinois, but he did spend some time at the University of North Dakota, so I'm going to claim him. Um, so we don't have him, uh, right? We're, he's not going to be available for the game. So it's going to be Marvin Jones and a bunch of backups. What's going on here? Yeah, it'll be kind of interesting to see what they do pull out there. But yeah, it's, it's almost certain that Kenny Gallaty won't play. I mean, he hasn't practiced in the first two days of the week. And, and I think it was Ian Rappaport said he's, he's likely to miss this game. The Lions obviously aren't going to divulge that sort of information because they don't like to say anything. Um, mm-hmm. But in terms of who who is going to be out there, it it's it's not set for sure. You know, Marvin Hall was the guy mid-game when, when Gallaty went down. Um, but in week one, they actually had fifth-round pick um, Quintus Cephas start in place of Kenny Galladay because Galladay missed the first two games of the season as well. And um, we were talking a little bit on our podcast. He went out and he looked the part, you know, he was getting open. He was seeing, I think he saw 10 targets in his NFL debut, which is kind of phenomenal for a a fifth round pick. Someone that clearly had gained the trust of of Matthew Stafford in training camp. So um, there's that um, chemistry there. If Matthew Stafford plays, Um, but Marvin Hall is their big play potential guy. And so, we know we know how beat up the the Vikings are at corner. Um, we also know how good their safeties are. So I don't know if if, if Hall is the right matchup necessarily in, in testing this Vikings defense deep. Um, but um, I, I I think I I wouldn't be surprised really to see Cephas out there. I think you know he's kind of he's been inactive the past couple of weeks, so um, he's kind of been waiting in the wings. Maybe this is a better matchup for him than than Marvin Hall, who really just kind of feels like he's only that deep play threat. And then obviously, um, you also have Danny Amendola, who's you know good for four eight yard catches a game. <laughs> the, the Jarvis Landry. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Uh, okay. Well, let's talk about that offensive line. So coming out of Wednesday's injury report, uh, it looked like pretty brutally beat up. But uh, we talked to just a little bit before recording. And uh, Big V seems to be uh, limited. And um, with Tyrell Crosby, too? I'm not sure. Uh, Taylor Decker is Taylor is Decker. Who, yep. That's it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. He, he returned. Um, in, so in okay, so what does that offensive line look like if healthy? So it's Taylor Decker, Jonah Jackson, who I feel like has been up and down. Yep. Some really good games, some pretty poor games. Frank Ragnow has been pretty good. And then I have no idea what's going on at right guard and right tackle. Yeah. And it seems like the lines don't necessarily either because oh, oh, okay. the the original plan when, you know, in training camp was, was very clear. It was, it was Joe Dahl at right guard. And then actually it was, it was Jonah, it was Jonah Jackson at right guard. It oh. was Joe Dahl at left guard. And then it was Halapuli Vati Vaitai at right tackle. But then last week everyone was healthy and it was their chance to finally put that product out there for the first time. And they didn't do it. They had Halapuli Vati Vaitai stay at uh at right tackle and then they had um uh drawn a blank here uh tyrell crosby at right tackle um so i th- they've really been messing with the lineup the entire week they don't know if they want vite at guard or tackle they, they he's he's played both but when when there's any injury at all it seems like they want to relegate him back to the interior because i think they're comfortable with tyrell crosby being that swing tackle that can play either position uh filling it right tackle so if i had to guess right now here and today what that lineup is going to look like on sunday it's decker it's jonah jackson on the left side frank ragnow vitae at right guard and then uh tyrell crosby over there at right tackle okay and you say that the offensive line has not been good um is that a product of a lack of health or have some of the players that you've expected to be healthy have played poorly well I, I was probably overstating it a little bit a couple of minutes ago <laughs> ba- coming off of that Colts game because that's a really good Colts defensive line and they just beat the crap out of the, out of the Lions offensive uh, line. Very familiar with this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so they, they, they really haven't been that bad. And, you know, if you put any weight into into PFF, their, their run blocking grade is actually very, very good. Uh, they seem to be blaming the running backs for, for most of the run game issues this year. Um, in, in terms of pass protection, they've been fine, really. Um, Vitae has been really the the one inconsistent and I mean you you can you can understand that he was mm-hmm. practicing at right tackle all off season. one injury happens and they slide him inside now they've been moving him inside outside it, it's obviously tough on on a guy who's just getting used to the guys left and right of him and the guys left and right of him have to deal with a new guy every week it seems like so I think there's a little bit of communication issues in fact Frank Ragnow said exactly that after the Colts game it just it feels like they don't exactly know what to do necessarily on the, on the right play on, on each play, given that 
people are shifting in and out. And some of that is injury related. Some of that is, is lines being stubborn related because like I said, once they got to full strength, it still wasn't the lineup we were expecting. So I, 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 I joke that the offensive line has been bad, but I feel like, you know, 30 fan bases complain about their offensive line. It really hasn't been that bad overall. It's just the run game has not been consistent at all. And I think you can chalk at least a little bit up to that to, uh, to just the inconsistencies in the lineup. So when you take a look at the Vikings defensive line, which I described fairly colorfully to you <laughs> yeah. uh, yesterday, um, and you see and you see that kind of matchup and you see, you know, hey, some of these guys are injured, some of these guys are not. Um, what is your impression of the – traditionally the Vikings like just harass the, the Lions a lot in the pocket. What's your impression of that like possibility going into Sunday? Yeah, I, I... – I think it's it's low, at least based on on your analysis of the Vikings defensive line. Um, but you know the uh, I, I've seen the Vikings defense too many times to to believe that that Zimmer can't coach <laughs> something up um, and and figure something out and and you know just scheme something well um, because you know that that Vikings defense has dominated the Detroit for for so long. And, and like I said, there's, there's enough inconsistencies on the Lions offensive line to, to believe they can mess up a, a game or two. I'm sure there's plenty on tape that Zimmer saw from last week. You know, the Colts didn't rush six a lot. It was four and five man rushes that just got to the Lions, whether they were stunts or, or delayed looks or disguise blitzes, that sort of thing. Um, all seemed to, whatever they did, every single play seemed to, to work. And so I, I wouldn't count Zimmer out in terms of just game planning pressure, <laughs> even with maybe the, the broken parts he's working with. <laughs> you must merely acquire a deforest Buckner. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> All right, let's talk about let's talk about the defense. So, uh Trey Flowers is dead, long live Trey Flowers. <laughs> um so the Lions edge rushers are Romeo Quara who has had a pretty good last two or three weeks. Mm-hmm. Um Deshaun Hand and a familiar face in Everson Griffin. Yeah, that that's pretty pretty much it at the at the moment. Um they didn't really have much of a black backup plan for for Trey Flowers. You know, they they did draft Julian O'Quara. He's on IR. Austin Bryan is a guy they were expecting more out of. He's also on IR, but he's practicing. So there's maybe a small chance he gets activated this week and plays. It's been about two or three weeks um since he's been at practice. Um but you know, we're we're talking about a guy who's only played about six career games. So mm-hmm. not a lot of threats there. Um but I did just come off of Everson Griffin's uh, press conference, and boy, is he excited to play! Oh, he's pumped, man. Uh, yeah, I, I I was just introduced to his intensity, and he's so intense that he is pissed off at Mike Zimmer because he called him a good player. <laughs> yeah, it's it's pretty great, dude. <laughs> a good player <laughs> sounds about right. Yeah. <laughs> He went on. He went literally on a five minute rant about how he thinks Mike Zimmer is a great coach, and he's going to show him why he's not a good player, a great player on Sunday. So <laughs> that's incredible. Yeah, uh, that should be you, fun. Do you remember uh, we uh, we asked him um, two years ago, I think, to give us a scouting report on Greg Robinson? Do you remember what he said? Oh man, I do. I have a vague memory of that, but I don't remember exactly what he said. Okay, I'm going to pull it up because I was just going to quote what I could remember from you, but that that doesn't, I think, do it justice. Um, let's see. Yeah, okay. Uh, quite honestly, he looks kind of lazy. He's lazy. He gets beat on the inside. I think the biggest thing is he's got to compete more, but yeah, he's pretty lazy. I feel like the rest of their offensive line, they do pretty well, but to me, he's kind of lazy. Well, I mean, history kind of <laughs> proved him right, I think, yeah. on that one. Yeah, well, he ended up getting like a bunch of sacks in that game, so he <laughs> <laughs> didn't have to eat his words. No, he uh, he says what he means. <laughs> yeah, he, he's, yes, a, he he's a fun presser. Um, but yeah, so uh, he's pumped, but is he good? Yeah, that I mean, that's that's the ultimate question, and uh, I think I think he'll be good enough for for what the lines are looking for. I mean, the big question is just how big his role was, because I think. Everyone thought when they when they traded for him, he was just kind of be going to be a, a situational third down guy, maybe second and long guy. Now he might have to take on a full time role. He might have to be, if not a starter, basically a guy who's playing, you know, seventy percent of the snaps. Even um, maybe maybe not that much. Even Trey Flowers was playing about fifty sixty about about sixty percent of the snaps um, prior to his injury. So, um, but I, I do kind of now expect him to really 
be kind of that full-time role, that that 60% guy, which means he's going to have to play against the run, which is something Trey Flowers has been phenomenal at. And Trey Flowers has really been kind of a jack-of-all-trades, and I don't think Everson Griffin is that guy. He certainly isn't that guy right now. Um, maybe maybe five years ago he was, but at this mm. point he's probably not. And so, um, yeah, th- there's going to be a bit, little bit of a vulnerability there, I think, especially with um, not not that Everson Griffin hasn't seen a, a system like Matt Patricia runs, but, um, you know, different players, different right. uh, guys he's working around. It, it'll be an adjustment for him. And uh, along the interior, the Lions seem similarly fairly thin. Um, Danny Shelton, John Penasini, uh, and Nick Williams, which I thought – Nick Williams was like a light nose tackle, but here he's a three technique. Yeah. Lately they've been rolling with this kind of a uh, interesting formation. That's really worked out for them. Well, in, in terms of run defense where they have John Penasini at nose, they have Danny Shelton and Nick Williams at the threes. And so, um, you know, really, really showing that they're trying to defend the run and it's worked um, real giants energy there. Yeah. But I guess it works though. So that's a little different. Yeah. I mean, they, they, they stopped the Jaguars, a good running team right out of the bye. Uh, they come back and do it again uh, against the Falcons. And then you, you look at their performance against the Colts through the first three quarters, and, and it was basically the same. Kind of fell apart there in the fourth quarter, but they were on the field for about 40 of, of the 60 minutes in that game. So I think that was just kind of like, we're tired. We don't want to do this anymore <laughs> type of thing. <laughs> I'm done with this. Yeah. Um, but but it has worked out. Um, you, you don't get a lot of pass rush from any of those guys, really. Um, but that's, I mean, that's just never been the Lions game. They've been a little more aggressive in terms of their blitzing this year. Um, so you'll see some of their their linebackers maybe pinch in through those A-gaps. Um, you know, they do that with pretty much all of their linebackers. Jamie Collins does it. Reggie Raglan is a guy they like to use in their pass rush a lot. But um, in terms of those interior guys, they're, they're pretty much just run defenders and, and really just there to hold their ground. <laughs> pass rush really just isn't their game. <laughs> no. <laughs> Sorry. No, no interest there. It's like a, it's, it's a long way away from like the days of Kyle Vandenbosch and Cliff Averill and Adama Kung Su, huh? Yeah, those, <laughs> those were some days. Um, yeah, okay. So not, not to make you sad. Uh, <laughs> so uh, speaking of not making you sad, let's talk about these linebackers. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think you're misguided, but yes, <laughs> let's, let's talk about them. <laughs> so um, I, so Jamie Collins has actually been playing pretty well, I would say. Yeah. Yep. Um, and is probably one of the elements of the pass rush, honestly. Um, but beyond that, you've got Jelani Tavai, you've got uh, Christian Jones, I think. Yep. Um, Reggie Raglan has seen the field a little bit, although I think he's also primarily like a pass rusher. And uh, Jalen Reeves Maven. Is that yeah. it? Do I count Miles Killebrew as a linebacker? What's going no. on? No, no, okay. he's special teams pretty much solely and now i think he's really repping more with the safeties again he kind of went safety linebacker safety back to safety um yeah and then jared davis is on on covid reserve at this point um he's kind of in the same boat as as matthew stafford we don't know if he tested positive or close contact so there's the potential he comes off the list as well do you want Um, him to come off the list (laughs) i mean at this point you know his his snaps have been downgraded so much to about 10, 15 a game where he's, he's also kind of just like a pass rusher sometimes. Um, and you don't really want him out for anything else other than that. And so you're, you're left with, I think Jamie Collins is really more of a versatile guy. He does do some pass rushing, but um, he's also their best coverage linebacker. Um, and, and I would say run stuff. He's basically the best at everything because everyone else is just oh, not good. so, not so good at everything else. Um, <laughs> I think Reggie, Ra- you've really seen them use Reggie Raglan and Jamie Collins. Those are their two guys now, basically, okay. um, which says a lot about, you know, their drafting skills because Jared Davis isn't playing at all. Jelani Tavai has seen his role go from starter to, you know, rotational guy. And he's been awful this year. If I'm, if I'm being completely honest, tackling issues, um, gap how, how's, issues. How has he been in coverage? Because I was told I was way wrong saying he was bad in coverage coming out of the draft. Well, I think, I think you, uh, you, you got a point in your favor at this point in his career. Uh, um, suck it. 10 people on Lions Twitter who got mad at me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's always been questions about his speed. I don't know if it's necessarily speed or mental processing, but at, at this point, it, they, they almost just don't even trust him out there on third downs. Um, the second round pick. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's the same story as Jared Davis, except expedited. They trusted Jared Davis for the first three years of his rookie contract. Really, yeah, three years of his rookie contract. Now in year four, they're like, oh, this may have been a mistake. Who was, to buy. Was, who was it that was talking up Jared Davis? Was it Andy Benoit? Benoit? Probably, probably. 
I think it was. It usually is. <laughs> oh, it was, it was him and uh, Senior Bowl guy, Jim Jim Nagy. Oh, that's, yeah, Jim Nagy. Yeah. 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 I got Love him to do a little spot with him because he's, he said <laughs> – he said Jared Davis and, and Jelani Tavai might be the, the best young combo of linebackers we see That's right. in the NFL. That's right. And uh, I, I'm sure he's an avid listener of your podcast. Um, yeah, at me I know, now. I bet. At I me bet. now, Jim Nagy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so it's it's not been great at linebacker. I think they found moderate success just using mostly Reggie Ragland and, and Jamie Collins, um, but don't expect too much out of basically anyone else from that group. All right. Um, so then we get to talk about the secondary. It's a little bit better, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. So, so the Lions, I, I feel like we go through a position by position where we're just like, man, this is not that impressive, but the Lions defense is not dead last in the NFL. So like, well, why not? If you, if we're upset with every position group, why aren't <laughs> they the worst defense? I mean, they were trending that way after going into the buy. Um, I even put together an article saying like, th- if this, plays out for an entire season it may be worse than the 2008 Detroit Lions defense which notoriously went 0-16 um, but the run defense really kind of came out and and showed up after the bye week and I think part of it is due to that adjustment on the defensive front the, the defensive interior but if we're okay. talking secondary man yeah, let's talk about I, the secondary that has not much to do with the run defense it doesn't and I don't know it, it they they don't get torn apart in the secondary because I think teams like to run on them a lot um, but we've seen that kind of shift back now that the run defense is improving. Well, now teams are like, oh, well, let's just throw on you. And we saw what Philip Rivers did last week. Uh, Matt Ryan had a pretty successful day, even though they lost that game. Um, and and I, I don't want to hate on the Lions corners too much. They're, they're young guys. Amani Oruarie last year, fifth round pick, a guy who, who played well towards the end of last season. Showed Hold a little on. bit you, of promise. You got at through the Big of the V's first name just fine. Enough that you actually had to say his first name multiple times so you could show off but man you mumbled through oruarie's name i mean you kind of have to right oruarie i mean it's, <laughs> everything is just like the same mouth formation it's just oruarie <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay so so he uh he's he's a young guy draft pick from last year you've got jeff akuda draft pick from this year yeah um so is it like a busted coverage thing just kind of rookie mistakes what's going on it's it's really just kind of looking a step behind. Um, just pr- it's not that they're they're misunderstanding their assignment. Um, they'll you know we've seen um, Okuda just kind of you know we, he's bitten on a double move once. He's um, you know a, a, a lot of really I think what's really caused lines a lot of trouble. And given they play a lot of man, they've been they've been playing more zone lately. But early on playing so much man, we just see them get lost in the sauce and cross routes. Just there's so much traffic there that, uh, you know, Okuda and Oruarie, you're going to make me take my time with that name now. Uh, <laughs> there's just, there's too much going on in the middle of the field for them to navigate through. And I think, you know, a lot of that is just like, they, they, they maybe they didn't see a lot of that in college. Uh, I, I, I don't know why I would say that with Oruarie we saw, or with Okuda, I should say, you know, Ohio State runs a ton right. of that sort of stuff. But, um, but yeah, it's just, they, they just feel like they're a step slow. And I, I would chalk most of that up to just being young and, and adjusting to the, the speed of the game. I'm, I'm not concerned at this point about Okuda's long-term aspects, but right now they're just not playing good football, and uh, there's really not, not not much else to say about it. Okay, so I looked it up. The Lions are 26th in points per drive given up, so that's, like, not awful. The Vikings are 29th. Um, that's that's pretty bad. <laughs> yeah, that's not uh, great. Bet the over, guys. Um <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about that, about the, that safety group. Also, we didn't actually bring up uh, Justin Coleman all that much. Has he been playing pretty well? He's barely been playing. Um, oh. Got injured in the season opener uh, and just came back last week. I would say he was okay. Uh, last week he did take a, a brutal 41 yard pass interference call that I thought was ticky tacky, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to hold that too much against him. Mm-hmm. We'll, we'll see. Um, disappointing. So who, who was playing in the nickel instead of him? Was it Trufant? It was Daryl Roberts. Oh, oh. Yeah. And he was also kind of so-so, you know, yeah. a, a lot of a lot of good plays, but uh, probably more not-so-good plays. All right. So, uh, God, the Lions have 13 defensive backs. Yeah. Um, and, and just to be – Desmond Trufant very well could um, return this week, but he's basically missed almost the entire season as well. Oh, uh, true to form, I guess. Yeah. Um, exactly. <laughs> sorry. Uh, let's talk about, about the safety. So you've got – 
Former Viking Jaron Curse, PFF mm-hmm. superstar Tracy Walker, actual good player from Rutgers, Deron Harmon, uh, former linebacker Miles Killebrew, and two guys with some fairly generic names and Will Harris and CJ Moore. <laughs> yes. And so um, the big news there, I guess, is Tracy Walker has not practiced yet this week. New injury. We, we didn't see it happen on the field. I think he played if not 100% of the snaps, close to 100% of the snaps last week. So um, he played through whatever it was last week, but trending not towards well. not playing. Like he, yeah, why, why yeah. would you put him out there if he's just not going to do it? Right, right, yeah, and he's been struggling. He gave up two uh, man-to-man touchdowns last week uh, to running back. Looked pretty bad. Um, hasn't been great at all this season. Um, Deron Harmon, though, has been solid, probably the best player in the line secondary this year, just kind of playing center field, not giving up a ton of stuff over the top. I think he has a pick or two as well this season. So he's doing what he's supposed to do, which isn't, you know, isn't a huge impact player necessarily, but he's a guy that'll just kind of make sure that, you know, when Justin Jefferson catches it for for 30 yards, it doesn't go for 60. Something like that. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, And then J. Ron Curse has kind of been working his way back into the lineup. He started the season on the suspended list. Um, They've been working in him more and more often. He's playing about... 50% 50% of the snaps as, as the third safety. But if Tracy Walker can't go, you have to think maybe, maybe he sees more time. Will Harris is the other guy who st- actually started the season starting ahead of Tracy Walker, which no one understood. And it lasted two weeks before they're like, oh, wait, what are we doing? And basically hasn't played since. But you have to imagine he might get some snaps in there. Right. It, it's just kind of, yeah, I, I think J. Ron Curse would probably be the starter this week, kind of in the playing in the box a lot. And then you might see Will Harris, who was a a third round pick just a year ago, um, rotate in there 40, 50% of the time. So um, we got former Vikings, J Ron curse, Everson Griffin, uh, Adrian Peterson, uh, technically Justin Coleman, I guess. Um, I don't (laughs) recognize anyone else in this list as a former Viking. Uh, And then we've got former lions, Amir Abdullah, who else is a former Lion on the Vikings roster? You know? Chris Jones. Chris <laughs> Jones. Yeah, Chris Jones, who might play. <laughs> uh, that might be it, though. So yeah. uh, we've got five revenge games. <laughs> oh, Riley Reef, duh. Oh, right. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we've got six revenge games slated. Uh, so, oh, so we've got Revenge Everson Griffin against Revenge Riley Reef. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's exciting. I, I just hope Matt Patricia didn't call Riley Reef a good player. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to give him that bulletin board material. Um uh, yeah, so uh so a ton of revenge games in the offing, some of them head to head revenge games, so that's gonna be exciting. Um but we haven't even talked about the best player on the Lions, Jack Fox. Um Thank you. Right. Uh <laughs> and then also actually Matt Prater has not been doing too horribly either. Um didn't he now like four fifty yarders in a game this uh this year? Not this year. He's actually been kind of kind of off this year. He he made his first so against Atlanta, he made two from fifty plus, I think it was, which was actually the first uh successful fifty yarder he had this year. I think he was 0, 0 for three to start the season, but in his defense, I think two or th- or maybe all three of them were fifty five or, or longer. But he's actually like last week I think he shanked like a forty six, forty seven oh, yeah. yarder. So he's he's got five misses, two from forty plus three from 50 plus. So, yeah. So he has been putting but a little bit. Yeah. Much. Yeah. yeah. In, in terms of, you know, I, I argue, I, I joke about this, you know, lions are kind of spoiled with kickers in the way that Packers are, are spoiled with quarterbacks. I don't know how we got the butt end of that deal there, but, um, Matt Prater has been fine, just bad by his standards. So, yeah. well, um, when you get Brandon McManus, uh, soon enough, it'll be <laughs> fine again. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, Jack Fox, though, leads the league in, in punt average and net average. So if there's one thing I want to brag about for, can we go like 20 minutes on him? <laughs> He's PFF stop punter. Um, he, I believe, leads the league in inside the 20 percentage and would have an even better inside the 20 percentage were it not for a touchback they should have gotten. Um, but two Lions players collided with each other on special teams, as happens. <laughs> as, um, yeah. And I believe he also, yeah, he leads the league in hang time average as well. Um, and uh, he's only had, was it 25% of his punts returned, um, which are 25.9, sorry, um, which of punters that have had uh, at least 20 punts is fifth. Um, and uh, his longest punt was 67 yards, which uh, ranks fourth uh, among those tied with um, Seattle God Michael Dixon. 
Um, like you said, he leads the league in punt average and net average. Uh, and then um, because the Lions offense hasn't actually had to punt as much as a number of these other offenses, is only seventh in total punting yards, which if we were going to do bad statistics would be uh, my favorite bad statistic. <laughs> yeah, and I think his net average currently, if uh, if he continues in the last half of the season, would be a, a record setter. <laughs> Jesus. Hooray. Uh, what what makes Jack Fox so good aside from the fact that he's got a wicked good name? <laughs> it's it's really just power. I mean, dude just kicks the crap out of the ball and and like you said, I think the hang time is is a key factor there too because he's not just booting it far horizontally but vertically so that the gunners are getting down there and uh, and downing the ball and and causing a lot of fair catches. Uh, he was a he was originally signed by the Chiefs, who also have a phenomenal punter right now. So yeah, I guess they, they Tommy Townsend is second, by the way, in in PFF grade. Um, so I guess they know how to find punters for as much yeah. as the Chiefs need them. <laughs> <laughs> and they really the interesting thing, I, I guess, semi interesting. I don't know how how interesting a whole segment on on punting no, we'll, is. We're, but, let's go, dude. <laughs> uh, they, they added him last year while they still had Sam Martin, a guy that they were perfectly happy with in terms of his production. But essentially, they just didn't want to pay. He was, you know, heading into free agency in 2020. So they're just like, yeah, he, yeah. yeah, he participated in the great Detroit Denver special teams exchange. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And so they're just like, you know what, let's just find a guy. They found a guy and, and you know, basically stashed him. I think, uh, was he on the practice? I think he was on the practice squad and then signed him to a futures deal. And they're like, yeah, we're pretty sure we got the guy that we want. They, they brought in Aaron Sippos, also a really good name. And apparently it was like a 50, 50, battle in training camp but uh they clearly found the right guy incredible um let's see does he do kickoffs <laughs> is it? Is it? no i think it's incredible uh he does do kickoffs yeah they don't want uh, they don't want and, old man and he's doing probably that. just fine at that you haven't brought that up at all so yeah, he must no, just be okay right. <laughs> sure uh, know, aren't they all touchbacks these days i don't i don't pay attention to the kickoff Oh, um, so actually, uh, there are a couple of teams that uh, we're, we're here. We might as well. Uh, there are a couple <laughs> of teams that that uh, that that try to um, that, that try to get returns going. So, uh, like the yeah, Giants, and, and the team. Lions do that a little bit too. I, I'm, yeah. I'm being a little facetious here, but um, actually, yeah, the Lions actually have the second or the third highest return rate on yeah, kickoffs. Yeah. Um, so let's let's take a look at average field position, a statistic that PFF finally has. Um, <laughs> which I've been begging for because I'm sick in the head. Um, <laughs> all right, we got we to gotta filter. So uh, yeah, like, r- right now, Arizona leads the league in average field position on kickoffs, which is at 22.7. That's like, if that leads the league, that's not that interesting, I guess. But Lions are fifth at 24.0, which means they beat touchbacks. There you go. And th- this isn't a new strategy for them. They've really kind of encouraged this since all the kickoff rule changes. They they want to kind of play with fire a little bit. I, I personally, do I think that one yard average is, is worth it? Absolutely not. <laughs> Absolutely not worth the risk of a potential kickoff return. But, uh, you know, Matt Patricia likes to play around with statistics. He likes to be stubborn in his own ways. And so this is something the Lions have done. And I guess I can't crit- criticize him if it's, uh, if it's worked even by one yard. But, uh, yeah, good for them. Uh, the... Um... The 49ers are dead last in average field position off of kickoffs at 32.2. Oof. Yeah. Actually, I think they changed their kickoff artists because of it. It was so Robbie Gould, which you'd think, um, was averaging 32.2. And then they switched to Mitch Wishnowski. Mitch Wishnowski. It's like an Orwarier no problem there. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, we definitely demolished that segment. Uh, well, it's, uh, unless you want to talk about returners, is Jamal Agnew like special or is he just fine? He's just fine. I mean, at, at times he's special, but he just really hasn't had that breakout. I mean, you, you know how returns are. They're, they're very sporadic. And so he's capable of being a really good returner, but not he's more, more in the punt game than, than the kick return game. And even, I mean, the lines don't trust him enough in the punt return game where if it's going to be an obvious fair catch, they're, they're probably going to put Amendola out there because he won't fumble it. Um, so Agnew's in the very specialized <laughs> position of kick returner and punt returner if we're actually going to gain yards on a punt return. <laughs> All right, fair enough. Uh, okay, yeah, let's do a uh, let's do a score prediction. So the over under is fifty two and a half. Opened at fifty four and somehow got bet down, probably because of the uncertainty surrounding Stafford. Um, right now, Vegas Insiders consensus has it as. Minus four for Minnesota opened at minus two and a half. Um, again, I imagine that the the COVID news plays a role in that. So, 
Uh, why don't Why don't we uh, Why don't we make a prediction here? Okay. Um, yeah, I'm letting you go first. By the way. All right. Uh, I think I'm with you when when you said earlier take take the over on this one. Um, it's not often that you get to see a Lions offense beat up on a Vikings defense, and I'm not necessarily seeing it happening. You know for all four quarters in this game because the Lions really haven't put together an all four quarters performance on offense. And I do think they're going <sighs> to frustratingly try to bleed out clock and, and run those long possessions that they like to do with, with the run game. And and they'll see a little success doing it. I think um, given that the, the Vikings haven't been particularly good running or pass defense, um, but the Vikings Correct. are going to be not been to... good at any element of defense. Yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Um, I, I'll be interested to see what the Vikings decide to do on offense in this game because the Lions run defense has been so good, but the Vikings have been pretty darn good at running the ball as well. And we all know that's kind of what their preferred identity is as well. But I think they have a big advantage when it comes to wide receivers versus this, uh, this young secondary. So I, I, I'm, I'm almost like the first team that just decides to air it out wins. <laughs> and <laughs> that like just grits their teeth and bear it. They're just like, ah, yeah. Fine. And, and that's what happened in, in the Saints game. The, both teams were kind of struggling right out the gate to, to get much going. And then the Saints decided, like, oh, well, let's just throw the ball. That works. And, and then they, they ran away with it. So I, I think that's kind of what's going to happen through the game. I think eventually someone's going to catch on. Maybe hopefully both teams catch on. And we'll, we'll see kind of a, a moderately high-scoring game. I'll go 31 Vikings, 24 Lions. Wow. Uh, so uh, So take the Vikings and the over. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was just going to, I was just going to take, um, take the spread and then just bump it up a couple of points. So it was going to be like 32, 28, but yeah, we both think the Vikings will score 31, 32 points. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So exciting game. Definitely tune in. Um, <laughs> unless you like good football, then, uh, watch something else. There's probably better <laughs> games on. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so this has been Jerry Rosen. You can find it. Was it at, uh, Detroit on Lion. Yeah, that's I knew I knew it was like a, a fun little pun. Sure. Um Detroit on Lion. Okay. Um and you can find him at Pride of Detroit as well as on the podcast. Is it just the POD? What what is it called? Yeah, it's the very poorly named POD cast. We thought we were being clever and then we realized no one could find it if right. yeah, that's gotta suck. Podcast. Uh <laughs> so just search Pride of Detroit on any podcast and you'll find it. <laughs> 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 i'm sorry dude that's just so funny <laughs> is, there, is there anything else you want to plug go for it um if you guys will be interested in my preview i do a big statistical breakdown friday mornings um but this sounds dope yeah send it my way i'll retweet it yeah um it's called on paper basically i i take everyone's performance each team's performance week by week break it down by how they performed against that team's defensive averages so you know Kirk cousins throws for 300 yards but the opponents are giving up 350 yards to we, we score that as like yeah. a negative yeah and uh yeah break them down for each of the the four units for each team and, and see how they match up oh that sounds great man thanks so much yeah no problem thanks for having me all right let's go to the mailbag and the first question is from raul who asks i'm seeing it i'm now seeing as many as six quarterbacks getting first round love in the draft if the vikings finish outside of the top 10 do you draft a quarterback or fill a need in the trenches so if, for it to be six, I think you would have to add Alabama's Mac Jones and Florida's Kyle Trask to the list because the only other quarterback that's playing well enough, and I don't watch a ton of college ball, so correct me if I'm wrong, but the only other quarterback that seems to be playing well enough is Wisconsin's Graham Mertz, and he's not eligible. Um, so, I mean, there's always the Gophers Tanner Morgan. I don't know that anyone is uh, super excited about him after the last two weeks, but um I would I would imagine it's those two. So you get Trevor Lawrence, Justin Fields, Trey Lance. Uh, you can switch the order of those two around. Zach Wilson, uh, who may jump any of those two. Um, and then Alabama's Mac Jones and, and Florida's Kyle Trask. So I imagine that's it. Um, I mentioned in a mailbag that there is the possibility that all six could be first-round quality quarterbacks, but I think it's unlikely. Like I think between Zach Wilson, Mac Jones, and Kyle Trask, that one of them or two of them or all three of them are going to either – return back to uh, college or uh, uh, are going to have kind of more about them revealed in the evaluation process that occurs um, at a much deeper level after the season is over um, that are going to drop them out of the first round. And we've seen this happen a lot where, where quarterbacks that are very productive um, 
don't end up and get some first round, um, you know, hype don't end up going in the first round. And I think uh, you know, one recent example of that might be Jalen Hurts, although I don't know how much of his first round hype during the season was all that honest. I don't think a ton of people were were super confident that he'd be a first round pick, especially after uh, his performance at Alabama. But I, I think that it is likely that, you know, some of these players will fall out of the first round. Um, so uh, that that is something to consider. But if all six become first round quality quarterbacks, that would, I think, be unprecedented. I don't know if there have been six quarterbacks drafted in the first round, and I am too lazy to look it up at the moment. But I know that it's been that four first round quarterbacks is fairly rare. I remember when um, there was that debate if, if Teddy Bridgewater was going to be the fourth quarterback drafted. Um, that there were articles published like, well, what 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 do you get out of the fourth quarterback drafted? And I, I remember taking umbrage against some of these articles because they were like, yeah, well, the fourth quarterback drafted you know, this is the hit rate. And it's like, well, the fourth quarterback drafted in that draft was drafted in the fourth round. That's not the same thing at all. Um, but that's, that's not even close to the same thing at all. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I was just like, why, why are you writing this this way? Um, but knowing that I went back to look at, you know, the fourth quarterback drafted in drafts where they were all in the first round, it didn't happen very often. So six might have never happened. Uh, again, I'm too lazy to look it up, but it, it's pretty rare. Um, so if that happens, then, um, yeah, I think the Vikings should take a quarterback. I think they should take the best quarterback available because um, I don't think that you're going to have Kirk Cousins for that much longer. Um, as much as I make fun of the Packers for having drafted a quarterback in the first round when they could have drafted a receiver, and they seem to be doing fine. So, you know, what do I know? But <laughs> um, uh, I, I think that it makes sense for the Vikings because I think that the the timeline for Cousins and the upside of Cousins is smaller than the timeline for Rodgers and the upside for Rodgers. And so finding a replacement for him sooner rather than later is a good thing. And you never know when you're going to be in a position to uh, be able to draft a quarterback again, which is why I hated when the Giants drafted Saquon Barkley. Now, it turns out they found a way to get back in a quarterback drafting position, um, not once, but twice, if um, if the season kind of plays out like it, like it has been for them. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, <laughs> so you know, who knows? But uh, a lot of times uh, you get into a position to draft a quarterback, you draft a really high-level player, they turn out, and then you don't get into a position to draft a quarterback again. Um, and, and you don't get into a position to win either. So I, I think that you should draft a quarterback to when, when you can uh, and then hope you don't get in that position again. And if you do, then you can get the guy you wanted anyway, right? Like you, which obviously not the same person, but you can get the position that you wanted anyway, right? Which could be an offensive lineman, which would be fair. It could be a defensive end, which would be fair. Um, it could be a receiver to replace Thielen at that point, which which seems like something that you might want to consider. Um, safeties don't tend to get drafted that high, but you know maybe think about it. Um, so yeah, I I think that you should draft a quarterback because the positional value is so enormous, and knowing sooner rather than later whether that that person is legit is is a good thing because then you can get back to drafting a quarterback if that guy doesn't turn out you can get back to drafting a quarterback even sooner which i think is an underrated part of this discussion which is that you get a free year of evaluation on this player and um and moving on quickly to a new quarterback has seemingly been pretty smart teams have stopped giving quarterbacks three or four years generally speaking and i started giving quarterbacks two years or in the case of josh rosen one year um, and so, uh, we're already having discussions about potentially replacing Sam Darnold and definitely potentially replacing Daniel Jones. Um, so that, that's a discussion that's happening more and more often because it is so much smarter to replace a quarterback sooner and getting an additional kind of head start on that. That would be a good thing. You know, I was just thinking about the, the Packers situation of, uh, of, of drafting Jordan love in the first round, which everyone in the league has thoroughly mocked and rightfully so i'm just trying to envision a situation where they decide to pick up a wide receiver like if they were in a situation to pick up say justin jefferson and like punt on and like do the and do the back and do the quarterback next year like it seems like that would have been a much smarter move for them and of course we have the 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 wonderful bit of hindsight considering Jordan Love right. hasn't exactly panned out in camp or anything. I'm pretty confident he was not the person on the field when Aaron Rodgers uh, decided or was, was yeah, taken out. We had a whole discussion about it, it turns out. Yeah, he's quarterback three. He hasn't been active for any week this year. Yep. 
Um, apparently has a lot of footwork problems to get through. I, I remember drafting him in one of the leagues. Uh, you fool. With, you should have drafted Tim Boyle. I... <laughs> I, I should have picked anybody. I, I, I could have picked up Taylor Heineke and been more like. <laughs> felt like I was being uh, old more. Second finest NFL player after Travis Fulgham. <laughs> be like, what I really should have done is grab the trick player out of New Orleans, but I didn't. I picked up Jordan Love with the last pick in one of the drafts, and the people who were still in the, were still in the chat were laughing. <laughs> like, just you watch. <laughs> we'll we'll see what happens with old bird bones by week 12 and bird bones we'll uh we'll see how that goes uh let's go to the next question which is from ian Pauly, who asks what baby steps progression would you like to see going through the uh, end of the year i.e young offensive line guys keep improving corners start to see the game uh slow down a bit etc um well i guess um i'm just gonna fall back on my normal uh heuristic here which is to say that because corners are more important i would like that um to to pan out a little bit more but i will say that there is a reason to push back on that which is just that um for the vikings it apparently has been easier to find cornerbacks than it is for offensive linemen uh and so it w- it would be kind of nice to finally see an offensive lineman besides brian o'neill pan out although garrett bradbury is doing that i mean he had a bad game um but um within the last couple of weeks but for the most part he's been playing pretty well uh, and so I, I guess that's it's it's not all bad for the Vikings in terms of evaluating offensive linemen. But if Ezra Cleveland, Cleveland turns out, I think that feels a lot more relieving to Vikings fans than like, you know, if Jeff Gladney doesn't turn out or something, people will be like, well, we'll just draft like three more. It doesn't matter. We just, we just <laughs> expect it at this point. Yeah. So um, that, I, I, it might be a bonus or something. So um, I think that kind of logically it would make sense to say, hey, I'd love for the cornerbacks to be able to take on uh, heavier responsibilities. And and the benefit here is that the Vikings cornerbacks have been so bad and so young. I I think it's a combination. I think it it isn't just that they're bad, but they're so bad and so young that they've had to change their scheme to a cover two scheme. Um, Now, scheme in the NFL, in the modern NFL, unless it's the Seattle cover three, really just doesn't like it's it's more the defense that you go to when um when you're not when you're out of ideas but as just kind of your base so you use it the most often but most nfl teams you know if you're a cover three team or a cover four team uh, you're only using that on the plurality of downs not even the majority of downs um and the same would be true for the vikings and the cover two but still they have changed to that cover two system which um, I remember back when when you know Leslie Frazier was fired and, and Mike Zimmer was brought in and a bunch of people were like, finally we get rid of the cover two. It's not working. Hate the cover two. A bunch of people hate the cover two. And there was a there was a bunch of articles written not just in Vikings land but generally that the cover two was dying or the Tampa two was dying. Um, while a lot of the reasons that's true are actually still true, right? You still have athletic tight ends that have the ability to challenge the seam that make it really difficult for linebackers to carry them. Um, I guess, unless you're Eric Kendricks, um, quarterbacks have gotten really good at throwing the corner route, which is really good against cover two. Um, so, so long as you've got like some underneath route kind of taking it away. Um, I, I still think that, you know, kind of protecting those corners makes a lot of sense for the Vikings, but it'd be nice if they could have cornerbacks of a quality of play where they can shift their coverages again, because the Vikings kind of have one blitz right now. Um, and if, if an idiot like me notices, I imagine that a bunch of NFL offensive coordinators have noticed, which is that they, they blitz and then they play cover four behind the blitz. Um, I actually asked some college people about it and what, uh, and one of them got, I was like, Hey, have you, have, do you have any resources to point me towards cover four blitzes? And they were like, yeah, we ran it a bunch two years ago. Uh, it didn't work. Don't do it. And I was like, Oh, cool. Great. Good to know. But um, they basically have one blitz, and I would like them to have more blitzes. I'd like them to be able to trust the cornerbacks in man coverage or play cover three with a wider um, uh, coverage responsibility for those corners on those blitzes. So um, there's a lot of reasons, I think, that that cornerback makes a, m- a lot more sense in terms of in terms of steps forward. Um, I will say kind of a dark horse here is that it'd be really cool if uh, it's one of those defensive linemen that was really young kind of you know, took a step forward. I think it might be a little bit too late for Jaleel Johnson. It certainly is probably too late for Shamar Stefan. But, you know, a Fadi becoming not just a starting quality player, but like a high-level starting quality player would be great. Or 
uh, Hercules Mata Alpha finding his true position, which is defensive end. If that turned out to be the case, that'd be really cool. Um, and then, of course, if DJ Wanham turned out to be really good, right? Like if he turned out to consistently play at the level that he did last week, um, that would be really fantastic. And I think that that would be kind of another area where you'd be really comfortable with. But I, I say cornerback is probably the position that you want. Also from Ian Polly, he asked, uh, this probably has been done in the past uh, episode that I'm forgetting, but new, uh, but uh, do you have a favorite frozen pizza hack or pizza in general? We can get Heggie's through Costco in Illinois now, so that's been a favorite lately. You know? Oh, man. That I, reminds me of all the takes that we had a couple years ago. Yeah, go go for it, and then I'll go. I was going to say, I this is where I get to be all snobby and say that I I, I never really liked Heggie's. I've never. I, I haven't really had Heggie's more than once. I didn't like it, but I haven't had it enough to have a strong opinion. I I used to do the bar thing all the time, and sometime around twelve thirty one o'clock, you got hungry, and uh, there I've I've had Heggie's As before, do. and I I haven't. It, it's been food, um, but and it, it was definitely at the time definitely drunk food, but I was never a really big fan of it, but. The thing that I would always end up ordering because it used to be like a just a thing even in the Twin Cities is is Pizza Corner Pizza, which was uh, made where I was getting my generals done in Valley City, North Dakota when I was going to college uh, or when I first had started going to college anyway. And so it, it reminded me a bit of when I was in Valley City. That said, they've since sold the, the operation to someone else and the pizza tastes way different than it used to. And I haven't had a Pizza Corner in at least – eight years maybe nine (laughs) that was it i haven't had it for eight years since (laughs) well it's you know i I really stopped hanging out in the bars right before like the the six or eight months before my kid was born so like and then after the kid was born i had an excuse to like no i'm staying at home i'm (laughs) i don't have a reason to to go out for a little and then after you know a year and a half i was like screw it i need to be out in public for a bit but no it was like i i just i i trying to remember the last time i had heggies it must have been at a no i i know exactly where it was it was probably at the uh it was probably at the broken drum in, in grand forks i think they had heggies there and it was probably overdone as well so as far as <laughs> frozen pizza tips now that i've alienated listeners who like heggies uh frozen pizza tip you know i you know, a little bit of salt pepper garlic actually does go a long way uh what you could do is 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 actually just do a little bit of uh, just saute the garlic in some some like decent olive oil first, and then you can put the the garlic on the pizza afterwards. So there's uh, there's certainly an option, or there, there's certainly a couple I, of ideas there. I think that's a, that's a little wild because I think if I'm eating a frozen pizza, I am not pulling out a pan um, and chopping stuff. So I'll say that. Um, Within this, I want uh, so within the spirit of frozen pizza and hacks that fit that, um, I would say sprinkling um, dried garlic on top. You know, dried cubed garlic on top um, is good. Uh, I think that uh, just having a basil leaf growing nearby or a basil plant growing nearby and throwing a bunch of basil leaves on at the last minute um, is good. Uh, sometimes I'll sprinkle oregano on. Um, those are all things that I think make garlic pizza taste like substantially better. Um, and I would recommend, uh, and if you don't have like, you know, dried cubed garlic, garlic powder is fine. Um, I would recommend staying away from garlic salt because frozen pizza tends to be like dramatically oversalted as it is. Um, and, and you'll begin to notice it once you add more salt. So I'd stay away from that. Um, but, uh, my, I think my favorite value frozen pizza, um, is the Totino's Party Pizza, which uh, I recognize no doesn't really taste or act much like pizza. It is really a pizza in name only, and I'm fine with that. It's like, it's like a flatter, you know how it's like a flatter version of a French bread pizza. Yeah, it's. Well, I mean, that like I feel like that is giving it too much credit. Even <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, we we had talked about it. We talked at yeah. some point about the Totino. I got a lot of hate for this take. And and, uh, (laughs) here's what I have to say to my haters. You are correct on this one. (laughs) Uh, Indefensible. Um, I I can't get enough of it. And it, the, 
I, I got addicted to them in college when when uh, you could buy each of them for a dollar. But if you bought five, for some reason, it cost like three dollars. I, yeah, I don't was, really understand. There's, a, there's how... something stupid. Yeah, I, I yeah. remember being in the same situation. Yeah. Um, so I mean, they were they were amazing, and then uh, they they were really like s- relatively small. So you'd heat one up, and that'd be enough for like one person if you're as small as me, um, or half a person if you're a normal human, I guess. Um, and so that, that, it just began a journey of me just kind of being a food snob, except in this case, it was just like, nah, I, I, I have to, and like, whenever I go shopping by myself for us, I'll buy it. But whenever I'm shopping with Chelsea, she's like, no, we can't buy any more Totinas or anything. I'm like, well, we're out. I ate it all. (laughs) That's why we're shopping. You don't understand. We We have to (laughs) replenish it. (laughs) <laughs> no we can't buy anymore so that's that's my frozen pizza take it's uh not a, an amazing take um and if you beat me up for it i, I won't resist see i also toss uh i i know that that sriracha is kind of passe nowadays for people but i i still put sriracha on on pizza quite a bit so oh sriracha is perfect for that application like yes we're, we we had sriracha overexposure and all that and i get it Sriracha is pretty perfect for that application. I'll say from the same company, their chili garlic paste um, is even better for that. Um, I don't know. Pizza can have any, like almost any variety of hot sauce put onto it. Like I think one of the problems with Sriracha is that people would replace other hot sauces with Sriracha and it's just not useful in a bunch of those applications. But this one, yeah, it's perfect for that. Yeah. Uh, next question is going to be from Michael, who asks, which Vikings alum will have the best day against Minnesota? I think the most motivated appears to be Everson Griffin, based on his <laughs> uh, name search of tweets today. Right. Um, so we discussed this a little bit in the interview. Um, so so the options are Everson Griffin, um, uh, Adrian Peterson. I can't believe I forgot his name for a second there. <laughs> uh, J. Ron Curse, who might actually play because of injuries, uh, and um, and Justin Coleman, technically, um, because he was um, originally a Vikings undrafted free agent. I remember Luke Inman freaking out because he really liked him in the draft. The Vikings got him, and and Luke turned out to be right. The Vikings did not, despite being the first ones to sign him. Um, he ended up playing pretty well for the Seahawks and the Patriots, and now he's doing all right for the Lions. Um, I would say. Uh, Everson Griffin. Um, someone was like, "Hey, Reef, pull out your old um, Brian O'Neill and Riley Reef versus Everson Griffin uh, notes from training camp." And I don't know how applicable they are because Griffin has just not been all that great. Um, I wrote a little um, e- like question and answer on Everson Griffin for um, for Pride of Detroit, which I'll link in the show notes. Um, he hasn't been all that great, but he also like knows Riley Reef pretty well, um, and so that that opportunity certainly exists. Although, in fairness, Riley Reef will also be having a revenge game. <laughs> uh, next question is going to be from Andrew Shad, who asks, was Kendrick's covering wide receiver a one-time trick for last week, or is he going to be sprinting up the field with whoever is in the slot till the end of the season? <laughs> no, that's just um, that's just like the coverage rules that time. Um, I asked him about it. He wasn't going to get into too much specifics, but... Um, that was just the coverage rules. Um, you know, uh, he has to pick up the inside most receiver. If that inside most receiver is running vertical, that's what ends up happening. Very often the inside most receiver is a tight end. Um, and that was just on that play, right? You're, you've got different coverage rules in every different play. And, um, the Vikings have been very careful about changing them up and became extra careful about changing them up after the Rams learned those coverage rules and, destroyed them with it remember um todd Gurley getting like three touchdowns against them or something i know it was anthony Barr giving up three touchdowns and it was just like todd Gurley on an angle route robert woods deep and um probably cooper cup on another one um they learned what the coverage rules were they motioned in order to shift the vikings into a coverage that they knew the vikings would run and then they would just put a mismatch out there on the field and it just happened to be anthony Barr every time but honestly um they, it was really more an exploitation of the coverage rules than it was like we think anthony Barr's bad at coverage because he's not going to win against robert woods um so I, I think that was just the coverage rules and i think those will change from week to week to week i don't think they want to see that again as as fantastic as that was i don't think they want to see that matchup again uh and so they'll probably switch them around again um just so that they can um make sure that that doesn't consistently happen 
Um, and so it could just be instead of covering the inside most receiver uh, on vertical routes, uh, it could just be making sure that they cover, um, you know, the hook receiver, um, you know, whoever, whoever breaks inside out of bunch and stuff like that, which is pretty normal for linebackers anyway. So I don't think that that's going to happen very often. Um, if they do, that's usually a win for the offense, even though Kendricks did a really good job there. Um, so yeah, I, I don't think that's really like a, a trick. Casey asks, thinking of how the Ravens supposedly built their offense around Lamar, could it be a good idea to build around Dalvin? Who might be the best type of quarterback for him? And does injury risk make this idea a bad one? Uh, well, I mean, there's a, a lot of reasons that this is a bad idea. Uh, injury risk is one of them. Another one is that tons of offenses have built around the running back and it hasn't been particularly great um, for them to do that. I mean, the, the Cowboys had an elite quarterback and they're still trying to build around a running back and it's just not working out. Um, the running backs that people have tried to build around, um, aside like historically, in the modern NFL include Christian McCaffrey, doesn't work, he's injured, um, although Mike Davis has been doing all right. Um, Derek Henry, so far that's kind of working out. I think it's losing its effectiveness. Um, Dalvin Cook, I think the Vikings are actually trying to build around him. I don't think that's, you know, turning out all that great Packers game notwithstanding. We discussed that last week about how that's uns- or last episode about how that might not be sustainable. Um, and then Ezekiel Elliott, which that's not working out either, also um, has had some injury problems. Um, so uh, I, I would say that no, you don't want to build around a running back. The reason that you can build around a quarterback is because um, the nature of the quarterback running the ball is that it tends to be significantly more efficient than a running back running the ball. And there's a lot of reasons for it. The first and most obvious reason is that um, when the quarterback has the ball, the defense has to account for the passing game. When a running back has the ball, they usually don't. And when they when it punishes them, it's like a flea flicker, right? Um, but they they don't, right? They, they have to account for the passing game. And so it, they're frozen and you get a couple of extra yards out of that. And then plus Lamar Jackson's obviously... Um, a remarkable talent. So then he gets to take use of the fact that that he's, um, you know, really agile and stuff. So there's that. Uh, and then also the second reason that that works out is that you have a blocking advantage because a running back acts as a blocker or on option plays, the unblocked defender is blocked by the, the, the trick essentially. So um, for people super unfamiliar with option plays, um, the most basic one is you leave uh, one, uh, end man on the line of scrimmage, they call it, but it's usually a defensive end, unblocked, and uh, read what they're doing at the mesh point when you hand off to the running back. And if the defensive end is crashing down on the running back, you keep the ball and move around him. If the defensive end is going for the quarterback or the mesh point, um, then you give it to the running back. And in either case, that defensive end is not a part of the play anymore, and so they're blocked by the option action. Well, um, there's that as a, as a way to get an additional blocker for the quarterback. But also, if the running back is just blocking, generally speaking, that means you have an additional blocker. And so instead of playing 10 on 11, you're playing 11 on 11 um, because the quarterback is usually not part of a running play. So um, that's the second reason it tends to work out in a way that it won't work for a running back. Um, so I don't think that you can really build around Dalvin Cook in the same way. As for what might the best type of quarterback be to build around him, if you were going to do that, it would be Lamar Jackson. And there's not one of those in the draft. Um, so that, I mean, that's too bad. And it's not like the Ravens are going to trade him away or anything like that. I, I suppose you could like hail Mary for Taysom Hill or something like that, but I don't really think that's going to happen. Um, the Vikings had their shot with Joe Webb and they squandered it. Uh, they should have optioned the Packers to death in 2013, 2012, 2013, 2012. Yeah. 2012. Yeah, uh, it was the Adrian Pearson season. Um, yeah, they should have optioned him to death, but um, they didn't. And uh, and and Joe Webb became a mediocre quarterback slash kick returner slash wide receiver with a, um, with slash, one with at least been, one fantastic moment in his career. <laughs> right, um, so I'll always remember it. Uh, yeah, so yeah, I, there's a lot of reasons it's a bad idea. Next question is from Mick, who asks. Is it possible that every starting quarterback between now and week 17 will not be playing against the Vikings? So this would mean that the quarterback that they started the season with would not be playing against the Vikings in the uh, in the latter part of the season. 
Right. Yeah. And, and, and we, we were discussing this question before the show. We, we decided that that would be the most generous interpretation given the schedule. So it would mean that Matthew Stafford would not be eligible to play against the Vikings this weekend, which we discussed in the interview. Um, actually, it seems likely that he'll play, but it's possible that Chase Daniel plays. So you get that. Um, then you get Chicago Bears, which means you get Nick Foles, who's not the starting quarterback to begin the season. Then you get the Dallas Cowboys. Dak's not going to be ready, so you get either Andy Dalton or you get like a double bonus version. You get Garrett Gilbert. Um, the Cowboys uh, Dak's have seemingly not going to be ready. That's that's how you're going to put it. He's okay. Not yeah. So so, from so, that. so Dak's ankle has fallen off and therefore will not be available. <laughs> I think that's more um, accurate, despite yes. the hyperbole. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, it's, it's one of the other, James. <laughs> <laughs> I complained uh, earlier about accuracy, so I suppose I'm getting what I deserve. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so the Vikings will either play Andy Dalton or Garrett Gilbert, or if the Cowboys are smart, Ben DiNucci. Um, then, <laughs> then, then you get into some problems, right? Because Teddy would not have to be available for Carolina. Minshew would have to be not available for Jacksonville. Which is possible. Uh, They've talked about which, that recently. Right. I was just about to say that is possible. I would imagine it's unlikely. Um, but because it's Jake Lutton is starting this week. Um, so it's possible, right? Um, but, uh, but it's like, it's just a thumb injury from Minshew, I think. So that, that might heal by then, but then at the end it is on his throwing hand. Um, so it's possible, but you'd have to worry about Teddy. I think it's unlikely for Minshew week 13. And then you get into difficult territory with the Tampa Buccaneers. Brady is aside, obviously from the 2008 season, notoriously you know, injury free. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's not something that even crosses his mind because he is so pliable. Yeah. I was was about to use pliable. Um, yeah, it's, it's the, uh, it's the crystal blue water and the refusal to eat tomatoes. Um, that's all you need to do. Boy, I can, I can, I can, I'll, I'll work on the tomato part, but I'm not sure about the crystal blue water. Uh, well, I, boy, do I have some resources to share with you, James. <laughs> is um, this going to be like the, the bubble water from, uh, from Russell Wilson, which is the, uh, sorry, the well, nano bubbles. Na- nano bubbles are science. And you know that because science papers written by scientists use the word nano bubble. So that's science. Uh, this is, <laughs> this is something greater than science. It's spirit. Um, oh God, <laughs> but there is scientific backing because they use the words crystalline structure, um, which is to say that the way the water molecules are aligned affects your energy, and that is good or bad, depending on how you have aligned the water crystals. Um, we've proven this by yelling at water as it freezes, and, and that crystalline structure is bad. But if you uh, play music to the water when it freezes, that crystalline structure is good for you, Um, and they're different. Um, Technically, none of this has been advocated by Tom Brady, but the the crystal water stuff is is Giselle Bündchen's thing. I I might as well just go into it. Okay, so (laughs) (laughs) we've already in the middle of this question. Yeah, we're we're already through the looking glass on this one. Yeah, so uh, at some point, Giselle Bündchen has advocated for um, water that you leave in blue uh, tinted glass. And and of course, there's like a a branded version of this that's the best you could possibly get. But um, that's just to ensure, you know, your health and safety, right? And you want to get the best that you can. But there's a a brand of blue bottle that is is supposed to be better for this. And you leave that bottle out, so you fill it with water and you leave it out in the sun so you can get the healing rays or whatever it is from the sun and that process only allowing blue light to filter into the water um which actually i think it's the opposite if it's colored blue because it's reflecting blue but anyway only allowing um whatever light gets filtered by the color blue um into the water with the sun's energy um which that sentence is accurate um i will say that the sun does give off energy. Um, that realigns the crystal structure of the water to be healthier for you. Um, I do not believe this is part of the TB12 diet plan, but I also know that he drinks this water or did as of when I saw this article. So keep that in mind. And that is why the bike Vikings will be playing the Buccaneers in week 14. Yes. And if I'm wrong, I will drink some 
blue crystal water. It's a pretty low stake bet, but yeah, I'll drink some blue crystal water. Uh, um, <laughs> Seems like a poor choice of uh, or poor usage of funds for the uh, for the Norse Code Patreon fund. But you know, it, this you know, yeah, well, it's for the people, James. It is for the people. Uh, um, then week fifteen, you get full, so you get that. Uh, then you get the Saints. I don't. I, I feel like it's going to be a breeze because it's week sixteen, and and the Saints are not on a path to clearly lock up, especially because they're in the same division as the Buccaneers. So I don't think that they'll be able to rest in week 16. I don't think that they've got seating locked up. So um, that's going to be difficult. Um, and then uh, you've got the Lions, which I, I doubt Stafford's on the COVID-19 list for that long. Um, but the Lions may rest their starters for whatever reason. So you've got that opportunity. But your, your key points here are the Jaguars, which is possible. The Buccaneers, which seems a lot less possible, and the Saints, which seems a lot less possible, and then the Lions the second time around. So it seems unlikely, but it would be an interesting trend. It's kind of like so in my um in my uh players of the year piece, uh I uh I listed four edge defenders and I listed Miles Garrett as a as a runner up, which um a fewer people than I thought um did not like that fact. But um, some people mentioned it, and the reason, um, despite the fact that he's like third or fourth in pressures and his PFF grade is first or second, or something along those lines, the reason I did that is because he's only really played against backup tackles this year, and so, and when he has played starters, they've gotten injured, and so he's gotten a lot of his um, pressures against backup tackles, uh, and so I think he's a great player, and I think he's better than a lot of the players that I that I listed, but I, I needed to have um, some accounting for context, and that if he's going to be um, he needs to be that much better against backup tackles. I think it'd be the same thing for the Vikings. So the defense will magically look good because they're going up against like David Blau or something or uh, Garrett Gilbert. I, I It's going to be tough to cheer against Garrett Gilbert, even though he's in the way of Ben DiNucci because he is an AAF legend for the Orlando Apollos. It's going to be tough. That is but, tough. That's almost like cheering against somebody from the Tampa Bay Vipers. I would never. <laughs> Quentin Flowers for life. Is he in any league right now? Hold on. <laughs> I was gonna say, <laughs> is this when you uh, petition to to have your Twitter handle be, now be uh, Tampa Bay Vipers for life? No, I can't take that away from that guy. Uh, <laughs> so it turns out Quentin Flowers. It, I love it when 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 Wikipedia is the first result because they're just like currently a free agent. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't have a job. Got it. That's the optimistic uh, uh, way of putting it. Yes, he's he's waiting to sign with it. He's between teams. Yes, but, but he's between practice squads. But <laughs> we'll uh, we'll see. Uh, Duke's code asks: Has Dom Capers' influence been shown schematically at all this year, or is it too hard to tell given the extreme turnover in players on the field? Well, I don't know if I've seen too many cover four blitzes, so I think that might be a Dom Capers thing. Um, I will say it is difficult to tell given the change in the covered shells, which really complicates what you can do um, when you blitz. Um, so I, I think they expected the corners to be better to be able to take advantage of the pressure packages that the Dom Capers can bring forward. Um, we haven't seen some of the staples that we've seen from Dom Capers defenses in terms of pressure packages, which include, uh, and we have seen some you know defensive linemen drop back into coverage, but it's been pretty rare, um, not as often as you'd see when uh, when Capers and LeBeau were designing defenses that that did that a little bit more often. Um, so not really, but I wouldn't be shocked if he kind of schemed up some of that cover four stuff that we've been seeing. Um, but it, I, I think a lot of it is just like, we can't really trust the coverage behind the blitz, so why would we blitz? Next question is going to be from Vikings After Dark, which sounds uh -oh. ominous. Uh, when so that, is, that is us, though. Yeah, well, I mean... Yeah. Uh, when considering the 49ers' ability to move on from Jimmy G without too much cap penalty and their, when healthy, roster uh, seems loaded, or that their, uh, when healthy, roster seems loaded, could you see them making a trade for Kirk, especially not wanting to develop a rookie quarterback when the roster is what it is now? I mean, if they keep winning, it's a possibility. Um, I I guess I doubt it, but you're right that so I looked it up and there's only like if they cut Jimmy Garoppolo next year, right? Like after March 3rd of next year. Um which by then Kirk's contract guarantees for uh, 2022. Um then uh they would only take a 2.8 million dollar dead cap hit, which is a net 24 million plus in savings. 
And so they would have space freed up. Plus, um, they might be able to move on from Richard Sherman um, at that point. And so they'll, they'll have a lot of space. Um, so I, I guess I could see it. Um, yeah, I don't know. Jimmy's not it, but it's not like Kirk is. I don't know. Like, Shan- like everyone thinks Shanahan likes Kirk, and, and I guess that's probably true. But um, I don't know. Like I, so when I um, when I project a Kirk Cousins trade, I, I see him going for like a, a second or third round pick, probably a third round pick. But most people, when they project a trade, and that includes you know professionals, right? It's not just like fans. Um, they they see Cousins being a throw in to another trade where you have to actually pay to get rid of him kind of like with um, Brock Osweiler. And and the thing is, and I discussed this last week too, um, but the thing is, I mean, Cousins is still like a high quality quarterback relative to the quarterbacks that you get on the market. He's not like Brock Osweiler. Um, So I think that even despite his enormous cap hit, that you'd still be able to get some, some picks back. The only issue is that we have to know what the salary cap environment looks like, which by March we will. Um, but, uh, one of the reasons that we didn't get very many trades at the trade deadline, one of the reasons the Packers apparently did not trade for Will Fuller, uh, is because picks are worth more in an environment where the cap is going to be depressed. So that's something that we have to see. I I could see it. I would put it uh, at like a, a 10% probability, um, maybe even less. Um, so I, I I don't want to like put too much fire on those flames. Yeah. Less than 10% even. And just as a, not really a correction, but just a clarification, you had mentioned uh, Richard Sherman or getting out, uh, getting away from Richard Sherman. Uh, his This is actually the last year of his contract. Oh, yeah. See, they don't even have to get out of it. Yeah. Uh, Beef Brewski asks, it's been about a year since that one guy ripped off that other guy's helmet and hit him in the head with his own helmet. <laughs> In commemoration, it like that, it, it, it's so much funnier than when we saw it live when we were like kind of horrified. <laughs> and we were talking earlier in the show, was, or like talking a pre show, that uh, that was easily a top five moment in the history of Norse Code. <laughs> we just, yeah, so, so yeah, so we very often record during Thursday night football because like the game's a blowout, yeah, yeah, and so we're just, we might as well get this out of the way. Uh, so we saw that live. Yeah, we that, that game had especially gotten out of hand. And we're like, all right, well, let's just record early. And then that happened. And I, <laughs> and as people who have listened to last year's Christmas show know, uh, because I clipped for I clipped it for it. Like, oh, hey, uh, Arif. So this is what just happened. <laughs> Go on to Twitter now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the question, the, the question is, what was the most shocking thing you've seen on an NFL football field after the whistle was blown. Uh, non, um, non Randy Moss mooning the crowd uh, addition. Right. right. Um, so you, so we both came up with the same one, but you dibsed it. So I'll let you go. Uh, the Andre Johnson, Cortland Finnegan fight, which incredible is which technically happened before the whistle was blown, but still there were a hell of a lot of whistles. Du- there, there were a hell <laughs> of a right. lot of whistles during it. That's for yeah. damn sure. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they, they had a, a play or so before that was, you know, close to fighting, but not quite. And the moment the ball was snapped, it was like two guys from across that, uh, that were waiting from the penalty box. Oh, yeah. Andre Johnson was, he was like, I'm not running a route. I no. don't care what the play was. Nope. Just, I'm going, I'm going right at you. And <laughs> it was like two hockey players that were like giving a sup look to each other in the, they, they were like in the opposite penalty boxes. <laughs> yeah, we're doing this. Yeah. It was uh, like, you I, doing this? Yeah. We're doing this now. And they were spinning around. Uh, the, the best part is when they're just spinning around. <laughs> and trying to like figure out if they're actually going to throw blows or if they're just going to be dancing. Cause that was really just an a, absurdly fun moment. I remember watching that. I remember watching red zone that I think it was red zone that day. And they were just showing that for a couple of minutes straight. <laughs> just like, well, nobody's in the red zone right now. So we're going to take another look at that Andre Johnson, Cortland Finnegan fight. <laughs> Might as well. Um, so that was in 2015, I think. Um, and if that's the case, that means, you know, Twitter was still a thing. But I, I kind of wanted... No, that's, uh, that's I, 2010, I, actually. It was 2010. Okay. What? Really? 
Yeah, wow. the, the video I just pulled up on YouTube is from 2010, so I'm going to assume it was at least from 2010. <laughs> oh, no, it was from 2010. Yeah. Um, what, what am I looking at that said four years ago today? Oh, that was Odell Beckham, Josh Norman. Oh, that's not nearly as fun. Yeah, so that was 2010. So Twitter wasn't really a thing because I was like, I don't remember the Twitter reaction. Um, I would love to ha- I, to see the Twitter reaction, and and not just because – yeah, I'd get all the the takes from people who are funny on Twitter and I'd get to steal them or at least retweet them. Um, that's great, right? But what I really want is, do you remember when Rudy Gobert got COVID and no NBA players on Twitter were like, oh man, I'm feeling for you, I hope I get better. But as soon as his teammate got COVID, all of the NBA, uh, the entire NBA was like, man, I really feel for that guy. I hope you get better soon, bro. Yeah. And it was just like, oh, interesting. I want to see what players stand up for Cortland Finnegan because my understanding at the time is that every wide receiver wanted to do that to him. So. <laughs> yes, that was the that was the, the that was the conventional wisdom at the time was that uh, like they had interviewed a couple of receivers afterwards like yeah no I I totally get it and Cortland yeah, and Finnegan like, was laughing as he was going off the field like oh yep, yeah, yeah. I, I he was, he was asking for more which is like that's like that's the most frustrating like he knew what he was doing right because that's the most frustrating thing ever. I haven't been in a ton of fights, but I've been in a few. And the most frustrating thing is when you're trying to wail on someone and they're laughing. That's just emasculating. <laughs> so, um, so he knew exactly what he was doing. Uh, that, that's um, for a Reese Fight Club corner later. You're right, yeah. <laughs> uh, I will say I haven't lost a fight, but that's mostly because I know how to pick them. Uh, <laughs> it's those, less about my fighting ability. Those poor, those poor eight-year-olds. Man, yeah, I well, don't... they shouldn't. They shouldn't have rolled up, dude. Yeah, well, uh, <laughs> that's it's it's in combination with a Reeves parenting corner too. So <laughs> it's not not too indistinct, but um, yeah, because a lot of people were like, "Man, this doesn't really seem like Andre Johnson." Oh yeah, Andre would never do that, uh, but he did it. No, but it's Cortland Finnegan. You don't understand. Well, that's the thing, and 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 there was a there was that great breakdown uh, this week on Twitter about how the Bears fight happened. And just and, and the fact that like it was they they actually labeled it as a Zabruder film style uh, breakdown of all of the reasons why this fight in particular had to happen on I think it was like Sunday night right uh, Sunday night or Monday night so mm-hmm. it was like you know he had sat down uh, you know he had the he had the face mask or he had the the mouth guard ripped off thrown on the ground and he had to wait a, a real 12 minutes before coming back out into the field. And he was still pissed off about it. Like, um, yeah, they, the way that they had explained it at the time for Cortland Finnegan was that, uh, he had been doing this and his goal was to get Andre Johnson out of the game, not just psychologically, <laughs> but just get him <laughs> physically out of the game. So after the game, I think in the interviews, he's like, yeah, no, I totally did that on purpose. Like, he got a hell of a fine, but it was worth it. I can't remember who ended up winning the game. It was, it was but... twenty five thousand, which is less than the amount of money that he spends every Christmas giving uh, toys to children. Yeah. Um. So you know, whatever. And plus, that money always goes to charity anyway. So I guess he was pretty happy with it. And it's not taxed uh, on it either. So yeah. The, right. At the time that that happened, the according to the the YouTube clip I pointed out or I pulled up, uh, the total or sorry, the game ended up being Titans zero, Texans twenty. So. All right. Neither player got suspended. Can, you can't – that wouldn't happen today. No, both absolutely not. Suspended. Especially Andre, but both players really got suspended. I know this gets pointed out often on Twitter, but imagining the malice in the palace when Twitter existed. Oh, yeah. That oh, would my have gosh. Been, that would have been just pure joy. In, Listen, we uh, didn't really get, get a good Twitter experience of a ton of like really great moments where it would have been. I just think the entire 2009 Florida Gator season would have been great on Twitter as well. Yeah, that would have been that would have been fantastic. The the OJ chase would have been <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that yeah that would have been like the it's going to be a day on here tweet. Yeah, that would have been a day. <laughs> that would have been a day. That I think I think that's better than any moment we brought up. Yeah, that would have been great for Twitter. Um, as for as for my answer to this question, which is technically it's the Andre Johnson Cortland Finnegan fight, I think the most shocking thing I've seen was when Albert Hainsworth deliberately just stepped on a dude's face. Oh, um, yep, yeah, that, it was it was up there with that, and uh, and Dominic and Sue just going to town, or it was 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 also in a stomping mood. 
Right. It was also stomping. But I think I think, but that I was think Thanksgiving. Um, I think that's what made that more egregious is that everyone yeah. was watching that particular game. But the the Hainsworth one, I think, so that one was, I think it's more shocking because A, it was on an unhelmeted face. Um, whereas, whereas Sue, when he stomped, it was on a leg, which is not great, right? I don't want to be like, well, it's just a leg. You can stomp on it. Um, it was a leg or an arm or a helmet, but it wasn't like a face. And then also apparently it ended up causing 30 stitches. Um, also, it was to Andre Garode, who everybody loved. He was the NFL's, I think, first black starting center. Um, he was, this is like a, a product of the of the the same thing as like how there aren't black quarterbacks or there weren't uh, as product of you know the center being a cerebral position and anti black racism. But um, everybody loved Andre Garod, right? And uh, and I said Andre Hainsworth, Albert Hainsworth, Andre Garod, Albert Hainsworth stepping on his face was just wild. Um, and this is back when when Hainsworth was good. He was a titan at the time. I was about to ask um, if this was before or after the trade. Yeah. Um, no, that was free agency when he went to Washington. They gave him like $130 million oh, back yep, when yep, the cap my bad. Was like, I knew that yeah. was free agency. I just, I, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and it led to like some that. great Onion articles at the time. It was like some some peak Onion content. Yes. Like they just had like photoshops of of him, but it's just a bunch of ice cream cones in a Hainsworth jersey. <laughs> <laughs> oh. But yeah, that that was, that's got to be one of the most shocking things. Yeah. Uh, Kenneth Allen asks, given the Vikings history after big emotional wins, we know they'll get blown out this week. (laughs) How does it happen? Crucial cook fumble. Another three pick cousins day. Everson strip uh, sack to end the game. AP's best game since 2015. All right. So, Hey, I remember, uh, kind of poo pooing this take after, uh, the, um, the Minneapolis miracle, but like a couple of people asked like, Hey, you know, teams historically do pretty poorly when they, when, when they're coming off of like an emotional, you know, comeback and the Vikings especially seem like that. And I'm just like, yeah, it's just noise. Don't worry about it. And then, you know, <laughs> um, which but it still doesn't fit. Right. Because they, they score on the opening drive. Like if, if it was, if it was a, you know, 38, seven game, you'd expect the seven to come at the end. If it was a product of, of, of not being awake, but you know, I've I've since calmed down on this idea just because I got proven so resoundingly wrong. Well, it's um, it's hard to look at the situation without changing your opinion after the incredible sample that was provided to you. Yeah, right. It's just it's 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 an it, n equals one, but man, was it a big one. It's, uh, plus, uh, obviously, they got steamrolled by the 49ers after that impressive win against the Saints, which also overtime, right? Yeah, I mean, um, it's, it's almost like a it's it's almost like you just watched it. What's a, it, it hit you like a punch to a horse in the face. <laughs> maybe it's just playing the Saints. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe it's just the Saints that do this. Um, I mean, the Vikings seem to do pretty poorly as a result of the of, of the Saints. Who knows? Um, I, I would say that the the most hilarious scenario, which is just sad but also funny, would be Ad- so Adrian Peterson, you know coach the rock it's uh for some reason it's late in the game and he's still running the ball and um any 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 breaks off for like a, a 20 plus yard run and uh eric hendrick somehow catches up to him i shouldn't say somehow he's not as fast as he used to be eric hendrick catches up to him pops the ball out uh anthony harris recovers the ball begins to run it back and he needs to right because we're near the end of the game the vikings are down by two scores and uh, and he needs to carry it back and then he gets the ball popped out. And so the Vikings lose because their defensive player returning the fumble fumbled it. I think that would be just like remarkably Vikings. And the only reason it's not like peak Vikings is because it doesn't occur in a key game. It happens against the Lions. But I think that would be amazing because it still has an Adrian Peterson fumble, right? And it just that just feels appropriate. But then the Vikings screwed up, even though this is the one instance where an Adrian Peterson fumble helps them. Boy, that's uh, that's really sorry. tough to argue against. That's... I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, boy, when you, uh, boy, when you put it that way, yeah, I can totally see why the meteor would hit the stadium. Yeah, that's. Uh... <laughs> yeah, I can't beat that. Hmm. <laughs> mm. 
Uh, Kyle Slaby, should I start Marvin Jones? Before last week, he's been a massive disappointment, and Stafford missing the game could hurt more. But he always kills us, and this game might end up a shootout. All right, so Kyle, think about this. Who does Marvin Jones kill? Xavier Rhodes. Who did he kill last week? Xavier Rhodes. So I don't think it's Marvin Jones against the Vikings. I think it's Marvin Jones against Xavier Rhodes. I I think you probably should not start him. Um, can't wait to eat those words. Uh, well, actually, you know, he's wide. Like, I think you shouldn't, you probably should start him because he's going to be wide receiver one and, and grab a ton of targets. Obviously, it depends on who you have. Um, but uh, that's only because Kenny Galladay is out. I think if if it was a normal situation, you would not want to start him. But I think yeah, if your bench is weak or your flex is not doing all that great, um yeah start marvin jones but not because he kills the vikings mostly just because you know he's going to be their top receiver uh but no i i think this is just he's just xavier rhodes's kryptonite and uh the, that proved to be the case uh last week so rhodes no longer the vikings don't have to worry about about that particular bugaboo but marvin jones is going to see a ton of targets so start him but not because of that but because he just it's probably a good fantasy play uh, also from Kyle Slaby, what has been your stress food of choice this week? Mine has been tortilla chips and salsa. Uh, Reese's peanut butter cups. So we never have anyone come over for Halloween, and uh, especially not this year. But um, yeah, I, going back all the way to my house in um, it back in the Marcy Holmes Northeast neighborhood, which is like four years ago at this point, um, and I lived there for like seven years. Um, I think like by the fourth year of my living in that house, I just, we just haven't had people come and trick or treat at our door. Um, then we moved to an apartment then we moved to this house. We just haven't had trick or treaters, but I always buy candy because like might as well, like uh, if they don't show up, Oh no, now you've got a bag of candy. Um, and so it's been that. And, uh, on, I only bought Reese's peanut butter cups this year. Um, Chelsea bought some other stuff like Jolly Ranchers and she can have them. Jolly Ranchers are great. She enjoys them more than I do. I like Reese's Peanut Butter Cups more than she does. So I get the cups, she gets the Jolly Ranchers. So that's what it's been. I, I went through an entire bag um, last night, uh, which is not good, but I don't feel sick, even though I had like a whole cup of cognac, like a glass, like like an unhealthy amount of cognac straight. But I didn't even get a hangover. Um, I don't know what that is. I don't really drink, and I don't usually go through a bag of Reese's Peanut Butter Cups, uh, and I uh, have yet to gain weight from it. So I, it must be the stress. So the rest of us can just hate you for that. Um, yeah. No, hold on. I gained a ton of weight over the past couple of years. Let's like <laughs> I'm just talking about last night. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, it does. It does take just a, a small amount of time. To, to 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 get the to get that uh, moving in the, in the no, right that, that's true that's true but it just it feels it feels weird that i don't feel any different as a result of an insanely unhealthy eating decision yeah i uh i did have uh i did have uh what i what i was referring to as uh, as an absurd amount to drink on election night so oh I, is that why we were stressed oh, i was just talking about um I can't think of anything else to make this joke funny. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't even like I, 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 it wasn't even just, you know, stress drinking or whatever. It was just, it was warm enough to be outside. So I had, I had the, uh, I had the bonfire going and I uh, had the, had the TV out or had the, had my computer set outside so we could, so we could watch the, watch the returns there and just, I burned through like all of my recycling, <laughs> all of my, uh, all the, all the cardboard recycling at that point. <laughs> Cause I didn't grab enough wood and I was like, okay, well, I'm getting a little chilly. Well, <laughs> Dude, we're going to hit like 70 this weekend and then it's going to be like really cold on Monday or something. Yeah. As, as it's basically supposed to be for November in North Dakota, Minnesota. Yeah. But yeah, I was like, I ended up doing that and I woke up on Wednesday morning with like a proper hangover, <laughs> like college hangover <laughs> just like <laughs> woke up was like okay first test am i still drunk nope okay not still drunk good good all right we've we've been through basic training on this what are we doing okay mainlining <laughs> water gotcha totally doing that something greasy on the way to work totally all about that uh nap in the car over lunch got it <laughs> like 
It's like steps. And by the afternoon, I was fine. I was like, man, I haven't been that hungover since college. That was a uh, wow. <laughs> that was that was a surprising night. Uh, let's go to Anton, who asks, as a continuation on the last pod being between holidays, uh, what would be the best Halloween monster to eat for Thanksgiving dinner? <laughs> Also, can we get an update from Don from Ohio and his pellet oven as lis- as a listener to uh, uh, request? Yes, apparent according to Don, he uh, he is he started it today. Uh, so I uh, prayers are our prayers and sympathies towards those who are eating food off of Don from Ohio's grill. Well, I mean, apparently his his uh, his wife is not going to be too happy about that. Uh, thoughts and prayers. <laughs> when he tweeted oh god she she ate something from a charcoal grill and now she loves it i just died <laughs> <laughs> like yeah dude it tastes good what were you thinking <sighs> anyway i'm still open to the idea that pellet smokers work you're not but i i don't know i, I just know i'm experience. i'm open to the idea of i just i i just have a problem with it philosophically and i imagine <laughs> <laughs> at some point i will be pointed out for the hypocrite right. that i am when i actually end right up yeah philosophically it. that that barrier is going to disappear when you use it in like 10 years but yeah yeah <laughs> when i can tell you what when i can sit and afford a decent pellet smoker let me tell you what <laughs> all right so best halloween monster to eat for thanksgiving uh assuming we're not pellet smoking it um Ouch. i would have to say probably the Bugs Bunny monster we mentioned last episode. You can't just I'm going, keep using him as no, your No, but, I mean, but, but go through them, right? Like, a mummy, obviously that's a terrible idea, Too unless dry. you want human jerky, which uh, we could ask your son about that, I guess. Mm. Um, but uh, other than that, not really a fan. Werewolf, I don't, I just from generally speaking, uh, mammalian carnivores are just not good food, um, from my understanding. Um and then, and then, ghost. There's no meat there. Frankenstein is already composed of human parts. Uh, Dracula, previously a human. So, like, I did. Plus, criminally underseasoned. <laughs> so, I, I like. Where are we gonna go? We need like a monster that is not a human or incorporeal. Like we need. And so, my first thought. Oh. The Bugs Bunny monster that's just a shape. Well, there was an episode of that that when he had lost his hair, too. So, you right? know. It's... Yeah, don't even have to take care of that. They could take... Is there Are there bird monsters? Can we do that? There's got to be. like, what, But they're not Halloween monsters. There's just like. Um, the, It'd be a monster what's the in the one same that... way that a Sharknado is a monster <laughs> yeah, right you're right yeah it's not it's not useful what's the what's the name of the bird that turned you to stone cockatrice no that can't be right trying to think of another type of halloween monster that you could eat and it's just it's just not coming to me no i think it does have to be well he's not even a halloween monster though so really kind of put in a situation of uh Mm. Yeah, I think you'd probably end up having to go with the Wolfman on that one and just kind of dealing with the situation. You can't. Yeah, you can't do that. Uh, if you if you were able to expand to like just monsters in general, yeah, like a Minotaur, right? Like that makes. But that's not like a Halloween monster. It's, I'm going to Google Halloween monsters because this is just such a, a pathetic list. Um, Halloween monsters. Let's see what we got. Um. 10 classic Halloween monsters. Uh, there's a bunch of writing about it. I don't really care. So vampires, no. Zombies, obviously not. Ghosts, no meat. Killer robots, no meat at all, obviously. Also, is that a Halloween monster? Um, they do list aliens on this. So the, I guess that's one answer to our previous question. But uh, they're not monsters. Halloween specific. I, I, I agree with you. Uh, mummies, no. Werewolves, just talked about it. The Grim Reaper? Well, there's no meat on his bones. Uh, witches. Same thing, they're humans. Clowns, well, if they're Halloween monsters, that's still about it. It's all humans. It's humans all the way down. I'm going with Bugs Bunny Red Monster. If we've learned anything, it's that humans are monsters. So... <laughs> uh, let's see. Depending uh, his on name the context. Gossamer. That's the name of the Red Monster? Gossamer? 
And he's orange, I guess. Well, depending on what the color tint was on your TV that you were growing up on. Yes. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Back in my day, we had something called CRT television. <laughs> if you had the vertical hold wrong, your whole life was just changed. <laughs> Nolan Kaler asks the final uh, question for this episode, which is question for a reef's democracy corner. <laughs> Do you, this I told, bit is getting out of control. I told him, I told Nolan that uh, we were asking this question this uh, this episode, and there was nothing he could do. Again, he, nothing he could do about it. Uh, Can't retract it. Nope. Question for Arif's democracy corner: Do you think Dusty is popular enough to win the Norse Code seat in the SB Nation House of Representatives, despite the fact that he is dead? Okay. Well, first of all, he's not dead. Second, there is precedent for a dead guy. Not that it's important because he's not dead. Winning. In the House of Representatives, it's a, James. It's the state house. Listen, you people who have been sending this thing, this story to me on Twitter because I'm a part <laughs> of North Dakota, <laughs> let me be perfectly clear here. You can blame me for a lot of North Dakota's troubles. And some of them, you might be right, but you <laughs> cannot blame me for what happened in District 8 in the state of North Dakota. That is not my district. I did not vote for the dead man which is a fantastic sentence um, <laughs> for the record. Uh, Wait, so geographically, where is District 8? District 8 is just, a, is just north of Bismarck. Oddly enough, I was actually born in District 8, but that has nothing to do with me voting in it. Sure. So you're a citizen of District 8 then? No, that's not how any of this works. I'm just saying, if I was born in Canada, I'd be a Canadian citizen. Yes, but it's not that it doesn't. The logic is impeccable. Yeah, but according to the no, because <laughs> according to state law, you need to live there for thirty in a district for thirty days, and then you would be able to vote there. If you do, but not you did live, live there, there for thirty days yes, when you were born. But the point is, is I didn't, I, I didn't live there you know, in the in the last twenty nine <laughs> days. It doesn't work like that. So no. <laughs> I didn't vote for the dead man. Now, what's going to end up happening here for the state house, not the the actual uh, house representatives, is right, the that house, yeah. yeah, yes, the state house is that the uh, he was a Republican. the The government or the, the 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 judges said that if he is elected, the 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 state representatives would uh, the state party rather would choose a replacement for him for a temporary basis and then he there would be a special election next year and that's exactly what's going to happen but the governor's already gotten in trouble for trying to appoint somebody to that seat so who the hell knows and who the hell cares he just decided he was just like well i'm 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 the big boss man here no one above me I in the just, state i just got reelected. i'm bulletproof <laughs> we're putting an oil man in there and <laughs> it turns out that Wayne Stengem said, no, that's that's not how that works. <laughs> we have laws here. And, you can elect uh, the dead man, but you can't appoint someone to replace him. That's not in your power. No, no. This, the state of North Dakota is many things, but uh, apparently, apparently there's a rule. Apparently that's just frowned upon in this establishment. I didn't uh, so, know. I didn't know that there were rules out uh, out west, but apparently there are. So if if our listeners or I guess if any, it doesn't have to be listeners. Um, so if anybody was voting between me, you and Dusty and uh, I don't know, who would the fourth party be? Justice? Um, <laughs> that, that seems like a poor choice. Right. Uh, I think Justice would conspire to steal the election and I think he'd probably be successful. So this is a moot point and Dusty would not win because of chicanery from Justice. But if justice was disallowed and it was just the three of us, um, I, I think, I think I probably win. Well, I'm not saying that. Uh, depending on our district and depending <laughs> on yeah, yeah. who who are the citizens of Norse Code? Yeah, that that would be the that would be the question. You know, Dusty would. Uh, would would be you know standing up for for truth justice and 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 whatever but not that justice and <laughs> not uh, that justice right and and justice mosqueda would be sitting there telling people that he wanted the all the votes to or he wanted the counting of the votes to stop that seems like a justice <laughs> thing to do <laughs> right so i mean you're you're kind of in a tough spot at that point but in any case 
uh, no, just uh, Arif uh, Dusty is not dead, so in this case, it wouldn't matter. Uh, right, that needs to be emphasized. He's not dead. We even we even linked to evidence in the last episode that he yeah. was not dead. We linked to his podcast appearance where there's video of him. He's not holding up this. He's not holding up that day's uh, newspaper uh, because I, mean, I don't think like they have talking... newspa- I don't think they have newspapers <laughs> in Denver anymore. Uh, but... <laughs> he's like referencing current events. It's yes. like. <laughs> it's, it's it's close enough really i wonder who would be the appointment <laughs> this is my question yeah, if, if dusty wins how do we we'd have to figure out what political party within the norse code universe dusty is in um probably the alienate our guests at all cost party oh yeah <laughs> it's it's the alienate our guests par, uh, at all costs versus kickers or people yeah those are the, yeah those are the two parties um so whoever constitutes the alienator guests party uh, would be able to pick. Yeah, I, I, I could. Uh, I, I just. Yeah, so justice would get that seat then. Yeah, you're yeah. Right. That that uh, would just turn into an ugly runoff at that point, and just <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like we're both just so tired of this. No, no just justice. You uh, you have fun spilling all sorts of that water over there. <laughs> All right, that'll be it for this episode of Norse Code. Hope you guys have enjoyed it. Arif, where can they find your latest work? Uh, yeah, you can find it at The Athletic, uh, theathletic.com slash author slash Arif dash Hassan. Um, uh, most recent piece is uh, Mid-Season Players of the Year, um, which I described briefly. But yeah, I just I pick an arbitrary number of players at each position and highlight their play. Um, I left off Patrick Mahomes. A bunch of people got mad in the comments, so that seems to be the argument du jour. Uh, and it's successfully distracted from the fact that I left Miles Garrett off, so that seems to be fine. Um, but uh, you can check that out there. Uh, I don't think any Vikings made the list. Pro- no, Dalvin Cook made the list. Um, but uh, the other Vikings that made it are honorable mentions, which I believe are just Eric Hendricks, Harrison Smith. So I gave it away, but get, head over there and subscribe and give me money. Um, head over there, subscribe, and argue with me in the comments. Yeah. Uh, which uh, which I've committed to doing, I guess. Um, so yeah. Otherwise, uh, yeah, I'm not writing anywhere else. Why did I say otherwise? Yeah, you can find me on Twitter <laughs> at Arifa Sign NFL. And again, if you if you too would like a phone case uh, or a baby onesie, or I suppose a T-shirt, <laughs> if you just you know want to do that, uh, you can go to thread. Or you can go to uh, NorseCode.threadless.com and head over to the collections area. All right, for this episode of Norse Code, I want to thank you guys so much. For Reef, uh, my name is James. Thank you guys so much for listening. And please remember that all things are possible through Ben DiNucci. And we will be back next week. Norse Code is the largest and only division of Norse Code LLC. You can find Norse Code on the Daily Norseman, SB Nation's official Vikings blog, at dailynorseman.com. You can also find it on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, Stitcher, or wherever fine podcasts are aggregated. Our Vikings blogger extraordinaire and generally useful human is Arif Hassan, and he can be found on Twitter at Arif Hassan NFL. You can also find his written work at theathletic.com. I am your podcast host and producer, and my name is James Pagoshnik. You can find me at the show's official Twitter feed at NorseCodeDN or my personal account at Big Mono. If you'd like to donate a few bucks to the show, you can make your one-time donation at paypal.me slash norsecode, or you can make a recurring monthly contribution by visiting patreon.com slash norsecode. A donation of $3.50 per month does get you bonus material from the show and much more. Any questions or comments that won't fit in a tweet can be sent to norsecodepodcast at gmail.com. On behalf of the Norse Code staff, we thank you so much for listening. Our formula is this. We go out, we hit people in the mouth. <laughs> <laughs>